and now we're good. Uh, we're reconvening the meeting of the Board of Trustees. Um, we have a quorum for those of you who, trustees who are uh, present on Zoom. If you'd like to activate your, uh, your microphones and your, uh, your video, we will take the roll. Broughton. Chen. I had to hit mine twice. Cisneros? Here. Dela Cruz? Delenn? Here. Duran? Here. Noel? Here. Seleg? Shelby? Present. Soul? Present. Stallings? Here. Tony? <clears throat> Trustee Tony is present. His microphone is getting worked on. You have a quorum. Thank you, Madam Secretary. So yesterday before we convened, uh, I'm sorry, before we recessed at the end of the day, we were on item 701 uh, discussing uh, parliamentary rules. And Trustee Sowell had raised a, a question about the ability to have a vote recorded when uh, due to technical difficulties, uh, a trustee was unable to, to make their vote known. And so uh, we've done some research over the evening and I'm told that we've got a potential answer and some maybe some discussion for the trustees. Roberta will be joining. Great, thank you. Thank you, good morning. Uh, this is Roberta Boomer, uh, again, uh, happy to be with you. Yes, I did uh, look into the question with regard to Trustee Soul's uh, concern about technological issues preventing him from being able to vote. Uh, there are procedures uh, that allow for changing one's vote either before the vote is announced at which case it is appropriate for any trustee to say, I'd like to change my vote. Uh, but I am suspecting that this is uh, what uh, trustee soul experiences, something that happens after the vote is taken and announced. At that point, uh, it, is, it is allowed, uh, but it is up to the uh, unanimous consent of the entire body. Uh, to allow for a vote to be rescinded and then taken. Uh, so the procedure would be uh, a trustee would say, uh, Mr. Chair, Madam Chair, uh, I was absent the vote. I wish to be on record. I would re request that the vote be rescinded. Uh, then that would require a unanimous vote of the body. And then without debate, uh, uh, then a new motion would be made. Uh, and uh, a new vote would be taken. Uh, the only uh, limiting factor is that this has to happen before the adjournment of the meeting at which this vote is taken. So it is absolutely allowed. Uh, and this is something that is one of the arcane uh, rules, uh, not so arcane rules in Robert's Rules of Order. It is not directly addressed in Rosenberg's Rules of Order. However, it is the prerogative of the chair in Rosenberg's uh, to maintain courtesy and decorum. And so that would uh, absolutely fit uh, into, into this category. It is a commonly used uh, method uh, as a courtesy to allow members who had to absent themselves either voluntarily or involuntarily uh, to be able to participate in the vote. Great, thank you for that clarification, uh, Ms. Boomer. Trustee Sowell, do you have any further questions or, or commentary on this or any trustee for that matter? I, I do just have some, some uh, commentary on it and I, I do appreciate um, uh, the, the response and the quickness of, uh, of the response. The only thing that uh, I might suggest, and I don't know if this would be allowable, I'm, I am um, more uh, cognizant of how this is used in a, in a legislative setting. And um, it, it would seem to me that we would be awfully time consuming. You have to rescind an entire vote and then have to every, have everyone sort of re-vote. 
uh, in the legislative setting, uh, what what's, uh, is allowed, the courtesy that is allowed is that you, uh, you would uh, just be allowed to add on to a, a specific item. Uh, and uh, um, you'd say, you know, item, you know, X, uh, I'd like to, uh, to add on and, and uh, be recorded as an I. And uh, just, I, I think the, uh, I, I, I wouldn't want to have it be as time consuming as, uh, as it sounds like uh, Robert's rules uh, would, would the, the road that they would allow us to, or, or, or tell us that we'd have to go down. That would be my only commentary, but I appreciate the fact that uh, there is an ability to do it. Thank you, Trustee So well, I, I have a, an additional observation on that, actually, with respect to what, what I've witnessed in the legislature, at least, which is um, <clears throat> the vote is, uh, the, the role is left open. Um, and so members who are absent because they're at another committee meeting, for example, or, or so due to some other reason, uh, have the ability to come back into the room at, a, at any time and then vote until the clerk or the chair of the committee finally call the vote closed. Um, just another option, uh, Trustee Tony. Thank you, Chair Duran. And uh, thank you, Trustee Sowell, for bringing up this issue. I, I, I do think there um, is a difference between people who were at the discussion. I, I mean, to me, there are two components to making a decision. One is what we receive ahead of time in the packet, and then the discussion itself. And a lot of times the discussion will sway, I know will sway the way I'm thinking about so something. And I think that from my observations, we have a very open-minded board of trustees and people really listen um, and take into consideration the, the discussion. I guess what I'd like to avoid is a situation where someone adds on later who wasn't part of the discussion, who didn't have the benefit of listening and hearing. Now, I understand, uh, Trustee Sowell, that was not your original concern. Your original concern was someone who was in the meeting, in the discussion, but was not because of technical difficulties able to record a vote. And that I'm completely sympathetic to and think we, we ought to allow. I'm, uh, I'm a little less um, uh, in favor of kind of a, you know, anybody can add on later whether they were present for the discussion or not. So that's my only comment. Any other commentary or question, discussion? I guess the final point I'll make jumping off of Trustee uh, Tony's last comment there is, um, leaving it up to the discretion of the chair is sort of puts a lot of pressure on the chair, quite frankly, right? Um, and I would want to avoid the situation where it comes down to, you know, the, by way of what we're calling courtesy, you've got a chair who is gonna, rec you know, gonna allow it for some and maybe not allow it for others. Uh, I'm not suggesting that's anything that I do, but certainly the possibility is there. I think that notwithstanding the time that it takes to uh, rescind, a, uh, rescind a vote and re-vote uh, as a courtesy for someone who's missed the, the vote because of some technical reason, um, I would suspect that it's a rare occurrence and probably worth the extra minute or two that it takes to do that, just uh, my suggestion. Does the staff need uh, direction from us on this? Yes, because I think um, if it is something we want to institutionalize, we should reflect it in the board policy manual. Okay, Trustee Sowell, is there something you want to put on the table for a vote, um, given the discussion? I, yes, I think I would like to make the motion that uh, um, uh, in the course of the meeting, if a, if a a member of the board of trustees experiences some sort of technical difficulties and is unable and has participated in the discussion and has been present and, and uh, is unable to vote um, uh, subsequent to the adjournment of the uh, meeting, uh, be able to uh, uh, request that a vote be rescinded and allowed to, uh, to, to add on. So just a point of clarification, uh, do you mean prior to the adjournment of the meeting, but subsequent to the vote? Correct. Right. Okay. Is there a second on that motion? 
Second. Thank you, Tony. Trustee Tony. Any further discussion or debate? Seeing none, can we have the vote, please? Broughton? Chen? Yes. Cisneros? Aye. De La Cruz? Delenn? Yes, and may I just say that I am going getting going through that glitch right now. So I may be in and out, but um, yes. Thank you. No. Yes. Trustee Noel, was that an aye? Yes. Thank you. Seleg? Yes. Shelby? Aye. So? Aye. Stallings? Yes. Tony? Aye. Nine ayes, zero nays, two absent. The motion carries. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Thank you, everyone. And Ms. Boomer, thank you for the additional uh, guidance. We appreciate that. That'll take us to the next portion of this item 701, which is a discussion uh, regarding the procedures for public comment. I will just draw uh, folks' attention to attachment B in your agenda packet, which uh, will, will guide this next piece of the meeting. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Duran. Uh, and I'm going to leave my camera off just because of where I live. <clears throat> Sometimes there are, uh, I live in a rural area and we have at times connectivity issues. So please excuse uh, uh, that. So uh, I was asked to look at public comment procedures of the state bar, state bar, uh, board of trustees, committees, and sub entities, and found that there uh, were. Um, variations on the theme um, throughout uh, the various committees. Uh, clearly, though, the State Bar has a, has a commitment to receiving input, uh, input from the public. And as Trustee Tony says, uh, it is valuable input that can uh, sway a vote, that can uh, change mind, et cetera. Um, it furthers the understanding of issues uh, for the trustees' consideration. Um, <clears throat> Bagley Keene uh, memorializes uh, the uh, opportunity for members of the public, sorry, to address the body, uh, but it also says that the body may adopt reasonable regulations that ensure that the intent of public comment is carried out, but uh, that allow for the uh, smooth and effective operation of the meeting, uh, including the ability to limit the total time allocated for public comment on particular issues and for each individual speaker. And this is very key because as you have all experienced, there are times when you have uh, an enormous amount of business to conduct before you and you uh, are faced with uh, many hours of public comment. And while sometimes a lot of time this is valuable, uh, at some point when it becomes repetitive and people are reading a speech, uh, it does interfere with the effective uh, uh, operation of business. And so we have provided uh, some recommendations with respect to providing a written public comment, providing oral public comment uh, and uh, and it is really the ability of the chair to effectively manage a meeting with respect to public comment is very much dependent upon uh, their understanding of how much public comment is anticipated before a meeting. The preparation of the chair prior to the start of the meeting uh, has a deep impact on how it goes. And so we have uh, suggested uh, certain things. So for example, the electronic sign-up sheet, which is used, uh, for example, by the uh, Judicial Council of California. This will give the chair in advance the uh, ability to, to know that a lot of comment is expected uh, or not, and therefore uh, can have flexibility in the meeting to order uh, uh, the business before it. Uh, so we have also made recommendations with regard to uh, directly affected entities. This came uh, as at the request of one of the sub entities uh, in reviewing uh, the recommendations. Uh, we recognize that the sub entities are not 
really considered individual members of the public. Uh, and the impact on them uh, is sometimes not able to be expressed in a two or three minute time frame. Uh, and so we have carved out an option for directly affected entities. This would, uh, this would require the committee coordinator to work with them with respect to their presentation in advance of the meeting, uh, again, to ensure a smooth flow of, of uh, the order of business. Uh, I am aware that Trustee Tony has, and I have reviewed Trustee Tony's uh, suggestions with regard to public comment. He and I are very much in alignment uh, on the uh, valuable nature of public comment. Uh, and this item before you today is for discussion only. We will bring back some recommendations for you at a future meeting. I only had the one comment uh, that I have discussed privately with uh, Trustee Tony, uh, he recommends uh, unfettered freedom of speech. Uh, and I uh, suggested to him that while you know a meeting is a public forum, a policy body has to give broad reign to uh, a person's right of self-expression. And this does include criticism of staff, programs, practices, and services. Uh, that the state bar uh, does not have to and has, there are federal state and state bar rules uh, when a speaker crosses the line and makes discriminatory or harassing statements uh, of state bar employ employees based on race, sex, color, creed, all of the protected classes. And uh, so uh, I respect unfettered speech, but when it crosses the line with regard to protected classes, uh, uh, I think that it needs to be reined in. And so I have provided some language to Trustee Tony uh, about that. Um, about that. So um, again, we are trying to ensure the effective uh, operation of a meeting. This will allow the chair to set a reasonable time limit uh, for total public comment and individual public comment and allow the uh, chair to take public comment even at the start of the meeting or when the item is called. Uh, we would also treat any elected officials uh, outside of public comment. That's another recommendation as when they are acting in their official capacity, they are not considered members of the public. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Boomer. Um, any member of the board wish to begin the discussion or ask a question of Ms. Boomer? Do you, Mark, want to give an overview? I have. Uh, had a bit of difficulty understanding how your proposal is different from Roberta's recommendations as opposed to uh, complementary to. Um, so maybe I, I know I personally would benefit from just really understanding the what you see as the key distinctions. I think the key distinctions and, you know, I... Um, really appreciate the time that uh, Roberta has spent with me um, discussing um, you know, public comment procedures and some of the other um, uh, governance issues. So I, I guess my main thing is, I, you have to understand my experience um, with public comment is in the most recent period is with the California Public Utilities Commission, okay? And I have seen two extremes. One extreme where a chairperson's goal for every meeting, every which generally meets twice a month, was to start at 10 o'clock and be done with all the business items by lunchtime. That was the person's goal. And what that meant is that the person treated public comment as a nuisance because it would sometimes get in the way of having the meeting done by noon or 12.30, okay? And would arbitrarily uh, announce, okay, we're through with public comment, okay? Just at a whim. And right now, the state bar rules 
gives the entire control of how long somebody speaks and um, how many people speak to the presiding officer. Exclusive, 100%. And I don't think that's inviting of public comment to have a rule like that. Um, when, when people are, um, I think there's a difference between you know, so for instance, in, in mine, there are certain parameters. Oh, and the other extreme is the current president of the CPUC um, will, I've been at meetings, you know, on a phone. I've been at meetings where there are 400 people who comment, and the public comment lasted from 10 o'clock in the morning to 6 o'clock in the evening. I think that I, 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 I want to avoid that, that extreme, too. I think that uh, part of a public body's duty is to conduct business when we meet. And we have to find that balance between public comment that is invited and uh, public comment not getting in the way of conducting the business, because that's an obligation that we have as a body, anybody any state body does. So that's why I'm saying in, in mine, the goals are to maximize public participation while setting reasonable boundaries that permit commission business to be conducted before the end of the day. Um, I happen to agree with uh, Roberta's um, comments on setting some parameters on unfettered speech and will be in this is for discussion only today so um, I will be revising my proposal to accept her recommendations on that and so basically what what, what, what this does is it sets a minimum for public participation it basically says public participation um, is at the beginning of a meeting okay so that I actually am worried about let, letting it happen in, in front of every item because then it becomes unpredictable. But it's, and that everyone gets a minimum of two minutes. The chair has the uh, freedom to increase the two minutes if the chair sees that there are only four people signed up and you think three minutes is good, that's fine. But it says you can't cut it lower than two minutes and that in terms of length of time, either the first 100 speakers or two hours, whichever comes first. And then that way, people in the public, we're sending a message to the public that we really do welcome public comment. And that during board meetings, um, there will be a public comment se uh, section that um, you know will go up to two hours, okay? And that's in every agenda. And if we don't have enough for two hours, then we get to move on and be early with our items instead of being late, as we often are. So I don't expect we're gonna have that many comments every time, but I think for the important ones, we ought to be prepared to listen to public comment. It's important. So that's what this, my, my, my basic, uh, that, that's the basic gist of, of my proposal. It sets limitations on the presiding officer's ability to cut um, public comment based solely upon their whim. Thank you, Trustee Tony. Any other commentary or questions from the board? I believe uh, Trustee De La Cruz has joined us. I just want to make sure that folks know that. Any other commentary? Again, this is discussion only. Uh, whatever discussion proceeds today will inform the next bit of work that uh, Ms. Boomer and Mr. Tony and Mr. Stallings, I believe, will uh, will engage in. I guess, Mr. Chair, if I could. Sure. I had a question for staff. Um, Leah, I know you <clears throat> asked Mr. Tony if there was a, a difference between our current practice and what he proposes, and does staff based upon the sometimes voluminous public comment that we've received on some agenda items, 
Is there any that staff thinks is particularly, uh, any recommendations that staff would like to have in place in order for that orderly conducting a business all while balancing the public's right to address this body? Um, well, I, I think uh, Roberta's recommendations make a lot of sense to me. I do think we need to standardize the process. And if I understand what Trustee Tony is saying, the, the approach, the difference between his and Roberta's sort of approach is that this would not all be at the discretion of the chair. That's a key difference. So it would, again, be reflected in the board policy manual, irrespective of who's the chair, here's what we've agreed to. And then there's this other distinction about is public comment only at the beginning of the meeting or can you allow for it you know, in front of the particular item? I think the board has to decide that. But I guess I would say, but regardless of which direction the board goes in, it's going to be an improvement because the lack of anything written down and standardized, not just for the board, but for all of our sub entities is very problematic. I also think the um, new element where we um, expressly state that impacted parties, and I'm sure this came, comment came up from the committee of bar examiners, and the law schools who have complained to me about having proposals in front of the committee of bar examiners that impact their accreditation and being held to, to only two minutes of public comment. I mean, so that is obviously something that we need to fix. So I think um, this is my long way of saying anything we do is going to be an improvement and I'm okay with, you know, whatever direction obviously the board wants to take. And I don't, I don't think you know, two hours or 200 public commenters, I don't, that doesn't give me, put, set my hair on fire. And I, as all of you know, I, I can't uh, think of a time we've had 200 people trying to make public comment. Oh, 100. Okay. Well, I can't think of that time. We either. might have for provisional licensure. Oh, okay. I wasn't I mean, here. I think yeah. <laughs> for provisional licensure, there were times when it <laughs> we might've approached those numbers. Yeah. And then, Mr. Chair, if I could just ask uh, our acting general counsel, Mr. Rotana, um, does OGC have any opinion uh, in this matter, any best practices or anything that you wish to advise the board of at this point? With respect to public comment, it's really a policy decision for the, uh, for the board to make and balancing the need to uh, have an orderly meeting with a desire to encourage public comment. So whatever the court, uh, the uh, the board of trustees feels is the best approach is, is allowable and would be incorporated into the board book for future reference. I think it is very good that we're being more specific because in the past we sort of have, have not had uh, specific procedures. Uh, and so this will inform the board going forward. Great, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rotana. Trustee Sowell, your hand is raised. Uh, yes, uh, I uh, uh, two quick um, uh, things on my part. I too share uh, uh, Leah's, um, uh, which she put forward as it relates to uh, public comment at the beginning of the meeting or um, uh, before each item. I uh, just definitely would be seeking some sort of clarification and some standardization of, of, uh, of that process. And then uh, my second comment is, or question is, um, when, we, when we come back and take an action on this item, uh, it will be an action that um, uh, is not just for the Board of Trustees, but for all our um, uh, subordinate en entities, correct? Or, or other entities that are associated with the, with the bar, correct? That's correct. Would that also include uh, what we do as it relates to written comments? For instance, in uh, items that are brought to our attention often, uh, for instance, like the, the Ginny item that's on our agenda today, uh, makes note of the fact that there were X number of written comments, you know, some for, some against, some for sort of modifications. Uh, is that a standardized practice for some of our, uh, our affiliated uh, um, uh, entities as well? Uh, Trustee uh, Sowell, this is Louisa. Uh, not at the moment. Um, the, the public comments that you are referring to, that was, um, that was a Jenny item that we put out for public comment, and we did receive a number of written comments that were included as part of the agenda item memo. 
Um, when we do receive written public comment in advance of a board meeting related to a specific agenda item, we do compile that and send it to either the committee members or the board. Um, and the same practice, um, the, the sub-entities also follow the same practice. Very good. Thank you. And I think Roberta had her hand up. Uh, yes, <clears throat> thank you. Um, I, I do uh, understand the desire to provide some very clear direction to, uh, for the chairs. Uh, when it comes to public comment taken at the start of the meeting or uh, at, when the, at the time the item is called, I would just like to suggest that, that um, I, I don't think that there should be a hard and fast rule, uh, such as all public comment taken at the start of the meeting. Uh, there are times when uh, members of the public benefit from, from hearing the staff recommendation. Uh, and same with the trustees. And so sometimes it is hard to listen to uh, 50, 100 hours, uh, well, people uh, speaking uh, without the benefit of the staff presentation. And so for, I think, I don't see that this would happen uh, to a large extent, but when there are a large number of members of the public who do wish to address, I definitely see a benefit to taking that public comment after staff has had the ability to make their case, make their presentation. You have had the ability to ask uh, your questions of staff and then trustees are in a good position uh, with a good understanding of the issues to listen to public comment. Uh, also do want to uh, uh, suggest, um, Trustee Tony, in your written uh, proposal, you had suggested testimony for up to three hours, and just now you had said two hours. So I just wanted to, to uh, bring that to your attention to see which is your preference, what's your recommendation. Gosh, I thought I said two hours. That's what I meant. If I put three on paper, it was my mistake. Um, so um, I'm not sure what I did, but you know, I make two mistakes. Okay, but I you. certainly meant two hours was the top. For uh, those of you who aren't in the room, Trustee Chen and I were just looking at each other, recalling that uh, we had public comment in the provisional licensure working group in excess of two hours, more than once, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah, that's what I remember as well. Yeah. So, so, so l l if I could um, just respond to a couple of things. My concern about allowing public comment more than once is it invites enthusiastic members of the public to comment more than once and to comment at the be beginning of the meeting and then to comment again afterwards. So I, I just want to make sure that if we allow uh, that, that, that there's some sort of provision that you can't get two bites at the apple. That's one thing, seriously. I mean, I've seen this happen. Okay, we, we actually had one meeting um, uh, a few months ago where one person, in fact, spoke four times at the same meeting, okay, and said the same thing. And I'm like, I, I don't think that's the purpose of public comment, okay? So that's one thing I just want to flag. When it comes to the question of impacted entities or parties that you, you know that we know are impacted, I guess the way I would like us to think about it is not to have to, to do it differently. That public comment isn't the place for them. The place for them is to be part of the agenda presentation. They get five or ten minutes when the agenda item is being discussed, either before or after the staff proposal. I do think it's important to pay attention to impacted entities, and I think it's important enough not to put them in public comment at all, but to carve out a special place for them in the agenda. That's my recommendation. Thank you, trustees. Uh, Tony? Uh, any anybody else wish to speak? Looks like maybe. Uh, Chair, Chair Duran, Sonia Dillon oh. here. Thank you, Ms. Dillon, and then we'll get you. Go oh. ahead. 
Um, I just um, heard what Roberta said about, um, you know, the, at the beginning of the meeting, as well as um, not in front of, but after the staff presentation. Um, and, and that would go also, you know, lengthily. But I, I think I would, if it were to be not only at the beginning, I would suggest that we still have it before any discussions because the document, the, the agenda item has been published. So for them to be able to uh, review that and provide their comments, because I think if we have that, that will be a whole longer discussion, which is really good because then we're going to hear and, and then we are all informed with what the staff has recommended or we have recommended. But um, I, I think I like if we were to allow for comments other than the beginning of the uh, board, the, you know, the sessions, I think uh, it would be good before every, in front of every item. That's just what I think uh, would be more efficient. Thank you, Trustee Dillon. Uh, first, we'll hear from Trustee Shelby, and then I see your hand is raised, Trustee Null. Good morning. The first piece that I would address is in relation to timing, even though um, and I'll frame my comments as it relates to uh, kind of local municipal government in my experience. And so I have been in situations where I have sat through public comment. I was listening to uh, Mr. Tony, where you have been there for hours upon hours upon hours upon hours. And although I certainly don't uh, enjoy sitting through that time frame because I feel like there's business that can be taken up, the value of people being able to come and express themselves the value of organizations being able to influence bodies, I think that's just a part of the public dialogue. And as a public member, I would absolutely embrace not putting a time frame around public comment. And I feel it's my responsibility to sit through the comments and weigh through them. I do think there are a couple of ways that you that it can be done. I think general public comment at the beginning of the meeting is amenable. And then I think there's the opportunity for people to sign up for agenda items and on their particular agenda item, being able to address that item. So when you sign up electronically, which I know is a part of the conversation, then on the sign up form, you say the item that you are there to talk to. And so through that, there's clarity around that. and. And then through the electric sign up, you have the opportunity if someone may have signed up for more than one item, and there will absolutely be people who do that. But, um, and whether or not it's taken before, you know, in my experience as it relates to local municipal government, when there are significant issues and staff can work it out with, with opposition, I think that's a great opportunity to proceed with staff moving forward, but I think it just depends on the issues. So those are my, my thoughts. Thank you, Trustee Shelby, uh, and Trustee Noel. If you'll if you'll permit me, I, I do want to actually um, jump off of Trustee Shelby's commentary because local government is my world as well, and and uh, right away the Brown Act comes to mind. And I'd like to ask Mr. Ratana. Um, my understanding has always been that uh, as a state agency, we're governed by Bagley Keene, and so Bagley Keene has certain minimum requirements. That must be met with respect to public comment. Um, could you could you just very quickly run down those for us so that we understand what our outer limits are, what the guardrails are? Yeah, Bagley Key requires. Um, Having a hard time hearing you, sir. Oh, can you hear me now? Can you hear me? No. No. Can you hear me now? No, you're very very faint. Um, I don't know if the folks on Zoom can hear you, but we can't hear you in the room. Oh, what about yeah, Suzanne? I can hear him loud and clear. Oh, we can't oh. hear. Okay. While, you're, uh, while you're working that out, Rob, we're going to go ahead and hear from uh, Trustee Noel. I apologize. Okay. I think you might need to uh, select a different microphone. Okay. And Mr. Chair, I can address that as well if you'd uh, like me to state that, assuming that you can hear me. Sure, we can hear you, Ms. Boomer. Please go ahead. So Bagley Keene states um, the state body 
body shall provide an opportunity for members of the public to directly address the state body on each agenda item before or during the state body's discussion or consideration of the item. I think that is the relevant section that you have been discussing. So that does allow for uh, uh, members of the public to address the body several times. Uh, and uh, it requires that public comment be taken before the body discusses or considers the item, i.e. takes final action. Okay, thank you. Trustee Noll, you've been very patient. Please go ahead. <laughs> thank you. Um, I, I really had sworn to myself that as a first timer at uh, one of these meetings that I just wanted to learn and to listen, but I wanted to take together uh, my experience with the comments from uh, uh, the chair and, and uh, trustees Shelby and Toby. Um, I have been on uh, many commissions. Uh, I've gone to, to, to countless city council meetings and, and countless uh, 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 board of supervisor meetings. And in virtually all, what has come down to be, it seems to me, the most um, efficient uh, approach is that in the beginning of a meeting, there is time for public comment on anything but agenda items. Can't speak on agenda items. You bring before the body what, and generally it is, particularly if it is a school board or it is a board of supervisors, during the pandemic, it's been a lot of swearing, telling uh, people how bad they are for making people wear masks, how bad they are if they have a vaccine mandate, how crazy they are to follow the science. And it goes on and, and can go on forever. And part of that is to uh, let people say what they have to say, uh, have a little limit on it, uh, and police it if it becomes foul or, or, or inappropriate. I don't really think that's the case often here. It may be, I, I don't know. But then of course, everyone has the opportunity to fill out a slip, a yes or a no on an agenda item. Say if you're part of an organized uh, presentation, and, and come and comment on that agenda item as a member of the public. Um, and then some bodies at the very end have allowed uh, folks to come uh, and, and members of the public uh, speak uh, uh, to the events of the day. Um, that's, that's relatively used, but, but I, I'm just saying, I think we, we do have, have an obligation to the public uh, I am not as clear on the obligation to let people act a fool uh, while they're uh, giving comments. Uh, that's going to be the chair, chairs, uh, uh, and, and, if, and if we have security, <laughs> uh, which they do in, in, en masse at uh, both board, uh, boards of education and and uh, any place where there are tough decisions made around COVID, you're going to get uh, people out of the woodwork who will stand in line. And I mean a line that goes to the end of the chambers, out the hall, all the way out the door to the park. It's an um, unbelievable uh, experience. And I've experienced it many, many times. And that's why Board of Supervisors meetings that used to be done by five go to 11 o'clock at night. Thank you, Greg. Any other input uh, or discussion or questions uh, before we put this to bed for a little while? Okay, seeing none. We'll continue through the agenda and uh, thank in advance Ms. Boomer and Mr. Tony and Mr. Stallings for the work they're going to do on that.
important issue of public comment. We have one more quick component of this multi-pronged agenda item, which I think Louisa is going to cover. Thank you. Yes. Um, so the next portion of the, this agenda item is the agenda setting. Um, your agendas have two main parts, and that's the consent agenda and the discussion agenda. Um, typically, the consent agenda includes any item that is routine or there are no known concerns from board members are placed on the consent agenda. And other items that require discussion from the full board are put on the discussion agenda. So right now, what we are doing is we are reviewing the schedule, and this is a schedule of reoccurring items that um, we would bring back to the board. And um, we're looking um, particularly at the reports that the board does not need to take action and trying to decide how else could we bring this to the board rather than agendizing it. Um, and. <clears throat> And so we will bring that back to the board at some point, basically noting all of the reports that will not be required to be on an agenda, but will be shared with the board in a different, um, in a different way. And <clears throat> Trustee Tony, um, we have heard your concerns about the financial reports being on the consent agenda. So going forward, we're no longer gonna be putting them on that we will be putting them on for discussion. Any questions? Trustee right. Shelby. Thank you for that. You know, my, it's, it's not necessarily a question, but it is a comment, maybe a concern, and, and, but I'll, I'll phrase it for you as a comment. You know, we are a volunteer board. And so I know for myself, um, juggling my professional responsibilities and being on this board. And I feel like it's an absolute honor to be on this board. So let me say that. But the juggling aspect, I find things that are on the agenda. I've, I make the time to prepare myself in advance of meetings. So if there are reoccurring items for me that don't fall on the agenda, they may not, I may not have the opportunity to get to them in the same fashion that I would in preparation for a board meeting or for a committee meeting. And so that's the one caveat that I would ask you to kind of put some thought into. Case in point, you send out a great email, um, usually on Monday evenings or on Tuesdays. And so on weeks where I have the opportunity to get into that email, I do. But then sometimes I find that it might be two or three weeks just because I tend to have an email backlog that is inappropriate. So um, it is, it's inappropriate, it's inexcusable, but we won't solve I'll it in the body. But, <laughs> but I say that because when it shows up on the agenda, then I know that it's something that I have to focus on, even you know consent items and the ability to take those off. So I just ask that as you explore this item, take that into a consideration. And I don't know if any other trustees feel that way, but I wanted to express that, so thank you. Thank you, Trustee Shelby. Any other commentary uh, on that or uh, the general topic? I will add just one point, and that is um, where the board is getting receive and file information, essentially, whether it's on the agenda or not. Um, I think it's important to remember that as a public body, the, the public should have an opportunity to review those things as well. So um, I know that when they're posted on an agenda, there's a way for the public to find those things. If it turns out there are things that we're not going to post on agendas but still distribute to the board, I would hope that there's uh, some some effort to place it somewhere on the on the State Bar's website where folks can go and look for that information. But I do uh, recognize and understand Trustee Shelby's concern about um, the backlog on the on the on the inbox. So, any other questions, commentary? Okay, wonderful. That was very brief and efficient. Thank you, Louisa. Okay, let me pull up what's next on the agenda. Pu public Seven comment. Ah, public comment for uh, the rest of the agenda. Okay. Uh, members of the public who have been waiting, uh, my apologies and thanks for your patience. Uh, this is the opportunity to address the board on any item within our subject matter jurisdiction or on uh, the remainder of our agenda. Uh, the secretary will um, will activate your microphone, and at such time, you'll have three minutes to address the board. Thank you. We do not have any members of the public who wish to address 
address the board at the moment. Okay, great. Thank you. Item 702 is... Sorry, I'm scrolling up here. This is a proposed amendments to Rule 7.40, Assignment of Judicial Nominees Evaluation Commissioners for the Rules of the State Bar. This is a return from public comment, speaking of public comment, and a request for approval. We have uh, Bridget Gram Grammy to report, please. Welcome. Struggling today. Okay. Okay. Good morning. <laughs> uh, yes. So I'm here to talk about the return for public comment on Rule 7.40 regarding the Jenny Commission investigation teams. Um, briefly, we talked about this at the at the May meeting. Um, the proposed amendments would give the commission greater flexibility in assigning teams to investigate appellate court candidates, and it would also clarify the composition of superior court investigation teams. Um, sorry, this is way left. Okay. Um, the agenda item details the 10 public comments that we did receive, um, and I just wanted to highlight a few of them. We received about four comments that expressed similar concerns to those that some of you expressed at the last meeting about um, the potential diminishment of the role of the public uh, in the Jenny Commission in evaluating judicial candidates. And so uh, I did want to just remind everyone we talked about this last time that the all of the public members still vote and evaluate each candidate. Um, this would just be giving a little flexibility with, with respect to um, the investigation teams themselves. And which were, which really is just calling, you know, we, we, we send out um, comment forms and then they will call and, and find out a little bit more information of, from the raters about what's happening. But each public member still does vote on, on um, each of the candidates. And then as you heard from Trustee Shelby earlier, um, we really have been increasing our efforts to recruit public members to the Jenny Commission. So for example, last year we just had two, mem two public members. This year, starting at, in August, we'll have five. Next year, we'll have six with everything that you just voted on yesterday. So we really have already been making an impact on increasing the numbers. And for our August cycle, we have um, we are going to be able to evaluate six of six appellate court candidates, up from the average of two to three. So we're already making progress, even with our existing members. Um, but there still is, as of right now, as of the July judicial vacancy report, there are 16 appellate court vacancies right now and over 100 superior court vacancies. So we just are still on balance recommending that the board adopt the proposed amendments just to give the flexibility if needed to take on more candidates to evaluate, you know, on balance, making sure that we can more quickly evaluate these vacancies. Um, and we, we did, if you can tell in, in attachment C is where we have the proposed amendments. One of the public commenters did did make a good suggestion that we add, you know, just our intention that we've been telling you that wherever possible we would still have a public member on each investigation team. So we would just we just added that to the proposed language that's before you today. I'm happy to answer any more questions. Thank you, Ms. Grammy. Any questions for staff on this item? I see none in the room. Uh, Ms. Shelby. Maybe not a question, but or maybe a comment. I don't have a question, but I have a comment. Good morning, and um, and so I'll, I'll level set by saying, I think it is incredible. And I want to remind people that we have increased public membership with the Jenny Commission with this new class by five percent. So congratulations to staff and all of their hard work as it relates to recruitment. Um, and as you remember, I did vote against this item as a public member. And I just want to clarify my position um, because I think that's important for the public. My issue is, is, is with the value of information gathering. As a public member, I don't have the invest, the invest, the, uh, now I can't talk this morning, the investigative background 
of an attorney, of someone who has gone to law school, but there are things that are valuable and important through the experience that I have had as a 25-year public affairs professional. And so I say that because public, public members bring a different level of perspective. And so that's why I believe that it's extremely valuable to have a public member that is part of the information gathering piece. And so that engagement all the way through the process is something that's really important for me. And so I appreciate, um, I appreciate you coming back on this issue and I know that we have to make a vote on this issue and I will not be able to support this issue. I wanna share that, but I did wanna put my comments on the record, so thank you. Thank you, Trustee Shelby. Any other questions or commentary? I see uh, Trustee Tony and then Mr. Sowell. Thank you. Um, I, I, the reason I believe it's important to maintain public participation in the investigation and in all of the processes for Jenny is because we're talking about evaluating judges that have tremendous power they hold the, uh, the fate of individuals, the fate of families, and the fate of communities in their hands with the decisions that they make. That's why it's important to have um, public, to, to not leave this only in the hands of attorneys. I'm, uh, I, I too am a public member. And I, um, you know, I, I have 12 attorneys who work for me, okay? So I respect attorneys a great deal, okay? I work with them every day. At the same time, there is value to having non-attorneys on our staff because the questions, as Trustee, as Trustee Shelby said, the questions that are asked by non-attorneys are different. Remember, when we talk about public members of Jenny, it's like public members of the bar. We're not just people dra you know, chosen by lottery, dragged off the street uh, because we're not attorneys and thrown on these boards. The, the vetting for public members of any of the entities of the state bar is rigorous and people are appointed only because they have a great deal of professional experience and expertise that they can bring and add to the process. So I also will not be supporting this uh, proposal. Thank you, Trustee Tony. Trustee Sowell and then Trustee Stallings. I too just want to recognize um, uh, the fact that uh, through the outreach efforts. You're on mute, sir. Am I? Now you're here. Thank you. Okay. I, I, I too just want to recognize uh, through the outreach efforts of, uh, of the staff and others uh, the, uh, the uptick in uh, the number of folks that uh, are, are now uh, public members and, and assigned um, uh, in this respective, uh, respective areas. You know, since our last meeting, uh, one of the things that I sort of thought about is, is uh, what role can I as a board member play in sort of the recruitment of additional uh, sort of public members uh, to, uh, to some of the bodies of the, of the board affiliated bodies. And I was just wondering if, if Bridget or, or Leah or others might just be able to give me just a little bit more of an insight on, the, on that vetting process that, uh, that might, might, uh, might occur in order to, uh, to be a part of, uh, uh, or be selected or appointed to be uh, on, on, uh, on one of these uh, particular bodies. Louisa, do you want to respond to that? Uh, sure. So as part of the appointments um, office, what we do is we launch a recruitment effort and we target both lawyer-led and non-lawyer-led organizations. And this year, um, specifically, we we came up with a long list of organizations and that was with the help of trustee Shelby and also other trustees who provided suggestions on who we can reach out to. Um, most of those organizations, as far as we know, did receive our emails. We did also launch a social media campaign 
And this was a paid campaign that we, we tagged all of these organizations in the hopes that they would be aware of the appointment opportunities, <clears throat> not for Jenny, but for all of the committees that we were recruiting for, and then also reshare our posts. And um, our communication staff handled the social media campaign and did confirm that several of the organizations did reshare our posts. And, um, and that did generate a lot of applications that came in from both lawyers and non-lawyers. Um, and then what we do internally is we just look at the applications to make sure that they're complete. And then we pass those along to staff and then staff in uh, consultation with the leaderships of their uh, committees and commissions make a recommendation to the board's appointment liaison, Trustee Shelby. Arnie, if I could just clar clarify, were you asking what you can do as a board member to help increase the- I, I, was, I was thinking, I, I, okay. in regards to this, I was trying to figure out um, uh, if I made recommendations. Uh, what the process was uh, that folks would, would go through in terms of the application process. Yes, that was part of uh, my question, was just trying to get a little bit more insight uh, in, into that. Um, okay. Um, good. I, yeah, yeah I, I think what I would say is that this is something, Trustee Shelby, I think you've mentioned, um, and you did mention it, I think, in relation to Jenny, but it's probably applicable to all of the sub entities, is getting a better understanding of what the optimal public member looks like. So that could enhance the kind of outreach efforts that Luis is talking about. Yes, I think we've made unprecedented efforts to reach out to non lawyer organizations, but once we know for each sub entity what is the ideal uh, candidate, that can help us target. The recruitment. So, to the extent, obviously, that within your networks, you identify folks that would be interested and, in, and in, um, you know, uh, would add to the to the value of the sub entity. I think you would direct them to our process, which involves an application that I don't think is too onerous. Um, so that would be the process for anybody that you identified in particular. Uh, but I think what we need to do is this much more expansive effort to better target uh, individuals who, um, you know, may not have ever heard of the state bar or thought that any there was any role for non-lawyers in its governance. Thank you. Trustee Shelby has one quick comment on this. And then I would also offer to uh, my colleague and to the chair that if you're looking for a meaningful way of engaging, we there were two appointment liaisons. We went down to one this year, and so it would be wonderful to have a comrade in arms to really do outreach, particularly with your experience and professional background and all the networks that you are engaged in. Thank you for that friendly reminder. I will tell you that there was a, a, a there was a portion of my evening last night where I realized that uh, that is a necessary next step for us and for me. So uh, I appreciate that. Uh, Trustee Stallings, you've also been very patient. Go ahead. Thank you. I had a question and then a comment. Um, Ms. Grammy, I know you covered this uh, in your presentation, but if you could unpack it just a little bit more, um, the public members who sit on Jenny have a chance to review the investigation that's conducted by the uh, commission members, the commission members present to the full full body. And then during that presentation, do public members have the ability to ask about certain aspects of the investigation? And then is there also a mechanism in which um, an investigation could essentially be sent back for further, uh, for further work based upon the recommendations of uh, the uh, commission and the uh, I guess specifically public members of the commission. So they definitely can ask questions in the middle of a meeting. The way it works is there's this there's a 90 day cycle. Um, and so th during this time, the, inv the the investigation teams are sending out their confidential comment forms. They're they're, you know, conducting their <coughs> investigation, talking to raters. And then every every other month, the commission meets and the, the investigation teams present on their candidates. There's usually two candidates per commissioner. 
And um, at that time, there's usually a very robust discussion. Did you ask readers about this? You know, so you have the opportunity to ask the questions. But usually they vote at that meeting and then make their recommendations to the governor. So I haven't, at least in my experience yet, seen them send it back for further investigation. Um, but it, you know, if they weren't satisfied with the response, that might be the reason that they do not, you know, they, they may vote differently than as recommended by the investigation team. And so then um, nothing about this agenda item would prohibit public members from expressing their um, feelings one way or the other about an investigation at the meeting of the full uh, Jenny Commission, is that correct? That's right. And, and there's always very robust discussion at these meetings. Um, and, and I would like just to say, just to address Ms. Shelby, I, all of us at staff and at the bar completely agree with everything that you've all said. I mean, we, we really think that this is very important and that's why we're undertaking these efforts that we are. The, the reason that we're still making this recommendation is because we do have this unprecedented number of vacancies and we don't, you know, on balance, we don't think that's good for the public either. And so we're making every effort that we can to continue as we are. But we're, but it's going to take time to recruit more people, as you know. So this is why we're just kind of, this is where we have landed on this. So then, Mr. Chair, my comment would be I'm in support of the recommendation and I'm happy to make that motion at this time. And just I'll speak briefly as to why I'm in support of it. I think Ms. Grammy has laid out um, that, that unprecedented need, and it certainly it's evidenced by the governor's appointment secretary making this specific request to the state bar. The state bar um, it has the, the pleasure of putting on this, uh, this commission and performing such, you know, such important work that uh, really touches on the lives of every single uh, Californian. Um, I will know in speaking with appellate justices that the need is real and that if the, if the need is, is so real that we have a request from the governor's office to consider ways to open up and, and kind of in my, my thinking, it's almost an access to justice issue, um, open up um, in this unprecedented time, the ability to have more individuals vetted, that I think that's a good thing. Um, I, I look at the rule and I see that there is um, language that I think helps to satisfy uh, some members of the commission's concerns, at least in my mind. I know it, I'm sure it doesn't in theirs, but um, but language such as to the extent practical, um, I think provides for an opportunity for, uh, for the state bar to, in exigent circumstances, um, move these individuals along. Public members still have, an, have the ability to vote uh, based upon the uh, investigation. And so there is still an ability for their voice to be heard. So I think while not a perfect situation, thinks the recommended uh, language bridges the gaps and really, I think, tries to capture the concerns of both sides. And so I uh, would move this item. Thank you, Trustee Stallings. We have a motion. Um, once we get a second, uh, we'll open it up for discussion with uh, Trustee Cisneros going first because his hand was raised before the motion. <laughs> Is there a second on the motion? Uh, I'll second the motion and then I'll make my comment if Please. that's okay, of course. Mr. Chair. Um, I want to support um, um, a lot of the comments that we've heard today, and I'm, I'm in full agreement with my colleagues that want to see uh, increased uh, public member interactions on the Jenny Commission, as well as we see everywhere else uh, throughout uh, the state bar and its entities. Um, however, as uh, now going on, uh, I'm a multi-year member of the R Jenny Commission, I've become very familiar with how this process works, and um, and I, I do have a couple of thoughts I'd like to share. One is um, I have a very high level of respect for the Jenny Commission. Uh, their work is always excellent. They make um, very good investigations. They have very robust um, deliberation, and I believe they make um, very sound recommendations such that as a member of the R Jenny Commission that reviews their investigations on the rare situation where their decision is being appealed, um, we almost never 
have a reason to disagree with the, with the work output of the Jenny Commission. I've also had the opportunity to become very familiar and I, I want to endorse and affirm your comments about uh, the, members, the, the ability for all members of the Jenny body to be involved uh, both in a robust uh, discussion of each candidate and um, having a, obviously a vote uh, on the decision for each candidate. And that gives me, um, it gives me uh, confidence that their voices are being heard along the way in the process and they would have the ability to sway an outcome um, from their perspective um, um, if it was valid. I will make a couple of notes. I note that the uh, Jenny Commission is chartered for um, a maximum of 38 members, which is fully staffed at this time. Uh, it is also says, the current rules say that um, at least 80% must be um, lawyers, attorneys, um, and, and the remainder may be public members. Um, given my math, uh, though, there's only four public members, and I would, I would like to encourage um, our bar and our appointment um, uh, <laughs> uh, overseers uh, to work hard to increase the number of public members on the Jenny Commission as we do everywhere uh, uh, in order to um, bring that more into balance. But, but following up on um, uh, Trustee Stallings' comments, I also at the same time do recognize that it is important to get these judicial um, appointments uh, completed. Um, it is not serving the public to have vacancies in the judicial system at any and all levels, and particularly with a, a, um, a particular voiced request from the governor's office, um, I do want to be responsive as much as we can be to, to uh, meet their request and serve the needs of the justice system. Um, so uh, with those uh, comments, um, I'm going to support, uh, second the motion, and vote in favor. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Cisneros. Uh, the motion on the floor is to approve the item as recommended by staff. Is there any further discussion here in the room? Trustee Tony, please. The thing that disturbs me most about this proposal is that it was brought, it is being brought to us. Um, the rationale for this is not, no one, uh, what I appreciate is nobody is saying that the public members um, don't add value. Everybody agrees that public members add value. So that's good and that's appreciated. But what I hear is that the rationale for this proposal is a backlog of vacancies of judicial appointments in California. I can understand a rule change for what we're being asked to do is to make a permanent rule change in response to a temporary situation. Okay, what we're, what, the idea is that this rule change, the goal is to reduce the backlog of judicial, of, you know, the processing of judicial appointments. And so with that caveat, I am gonna introduce an amendment to this motion. And the amendment is that we um, that, that, that this uh, proposal um, um, will, will be in effect for the next 12 months. What that does is it allows us to evaluate in the, um, you know, 12 months, 10 months from now. It allows us to evaluate the progress and to see if the need is still there. That I could support. I could support something where we are um, um, making a, uh, a, 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 a temporary change in response to a extraordinary need rather than a permanent change to an extraordinary need. So that is, my, uh, that is the amendment I would like to 
um, uh, put on the table. Thank you, Trustee Tony. So at this point, there is uh, what could be considered a friendly amendment if the maker of the motion and the seconder uh, accept it, in which case, uh, Trustee Shelby has a question. Go ahead. I have a question. First of all, I, I appreciate that. And I have a question. This is for um, our general counsel. Procedurally, because this is something that went out for public comment 45 days ago and we're being asked to move on that, is it possible to move forward with the motion? I just want to get some clarification procedurally in terms of what our choices and options are today. Yeah, can you hear me? No. Barely. Uh, yeah, you're very faint, Rob. I'm sorry. Is there any way on our end to raise the volume of? I, I um, there you go. Better. That's Thank better. You. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Yeah, it went out for public comment. So I just want to make sure I'm understanding your question. It did go out for public comment. And so now is the appropriate time to, to vote on it. I'm not sure I understand the question. So the, the question is that Trustee Tony was proposing an amendment to the to the resolution that we're voting on today. My question is procedurally, what options do we have? Because it went out for public comment, do we have the opportunity to influence that? So procedurally, what would oh, you share I with us? So if there's a substantive change to the rule, then I believe it needs to go out for public comment again. If, if it's uh, clarifying the way the, the rule has been modified for, for the purposes of today's agenda item, is clarifying language. If you would, if you change the substance of the rule, then it needs to go back out to public comment. Okay, and I ask that because I'd like to second Mr. Tony's motion. His um, so that's why I would love for that's why I was asking for your clarification. Yeah, right. If there's a substantive Robert, change, you, it needs to go back out. But Robert, are you saying a time limit is a substantive change? That's my next question. It shouldn't be. Yeah, that's right. I, 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 that's correct. So if it is just the time limit, then I believe it. Would need to go. It would not be a substantive change. I'm not changing the substance. Yeah, that's correct. I take that. That's correct. I agree. Uh, so just to bring folks up to speed, the executive director and I are having a sidebar. Um, in her experience, she's not seen a rule change with a time limitation on it, um, and that alone makes me feel like it's substantive, um, especially given the where the request came from. Essentially. The governor's office and the appointment secretary. I think this fundamentally changes not necessarily what they're asking for, but the lifespan of it. Um, one potential, and I realize we have a couple of motions on the floor, so just bear with me for a second. Um, one potential way to maybe uh, address what Trustee Tony and Trustee Shelby now are asking for is um, if the board were to move forward on the item as presented and then in a second motion say that the issue must be brought back to the board a year from now for examination and potential uh, rescission of the rule or amendment of the rule. It would require another 45 day public comment period, I'm assuming, but it does at least formalize the notion that this is not meant to be forever. Just, just a thought. Now, absent that, uh, what we have is a motion on the floor from, from Trustee Stallings that's been seconded. Uh, we can't even consider your motion a friendly amendment, I don't think, because, uh, and Mr. Ratana helped me out here, whether it's your call or mine, as to whether that proposed amendment is substantive requiring uh, uh, further public comment, or further, yeah, further re release for public comment. So do we have yeah. a, is that, can you tell me procedurally how that works? Yeah, I believe it's the chair's prerogative. Uh, the issue is whether or not it's considered a substantive change or not. If it is a substantive change, then it has to go out for public comment again. So I guess my question to our GC is, is it substantive or not? That's where that's where it seems like we're hinging. And is that, do you define that or does the chair define that? And the reason why I ask is because in meeting with the vice chair of Jenny, who was going to be the chair of Jenny, there was a commitment that was made um, I don't want to share too much in the in terms of conversations that we've had and so i'm trying to figure out the best way of framing comments but we did have a conversation about being very intentional as it relates to moving forward for the addition of public the addition of the inclusion of additional public members in our outreach as it relates to the appointment process it's probably the best way of saying it appointments process this time next year 
and the commitment of having a conversation in the fall, defining very clearly where the needs were, because there were, there were, in terms of applicants that were advanced, there was a recommendation that I made as the appointment liaison that was not necessarily on par with the recommendation that was made by leadership of Jenny. We had a conversation and our resolution was, I think that's the best way of saying it, our resolution of that conversation was supporting the way that the um, appointment process proceeded today with the commitment of in the fall being able to really define what the need was based on the composition and ensuring that there would be a, 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 a very focused outreach on more public members. So that's why I'm in support of the timeline amendment inside of the motion. And so, and that's why I'm very curious to figure out who defines substantive. So hopefully that helps in terms of, in terms of where things are, I don't know. I am, um, I'm open to hearing uh, further input, commentary, discussion, and absent that I will tell you where I come down on with a substantive issue. Brandon, go ahead. So Mr. Chair, I guess my, my analysis would be if, if the question is whether I consider this a friendly amendment in, in my decision-making process, I do not believe that it is. Um, and then as far as who is, I guess, the finder of fact in this uh, situation, I think general counsel can advise the, um, the board and that in my experience, the board chair has been the one to reach that ultimate decision on whether or not it goes uh, back for public comment. And so I think that it would rest upon the chair. I do not consider this a friendly amendment and uh, would not support it. Mr. Rotana, did you want to add something? Yeah, so I mean, I think hearing all the conversations, I do feel like changing the time limit would be a substantive change, changes the effect of the rule. So that's where I come out on this. I think it's up to um, the board chair. Um, okay, uh, thank you for that. Um, I have to say, I was just close to changing my mind. Um, uh, again, I think it's a, I think it's, um, I think either interpretation is reasonable given uh, the advice of the general counsel's office. Uh, we're going to go ahead and make that call a substantive substantive change. Uh, I understand that that doesn't address the concerns that have been raised here today. I I would raise again uh, the potential back back uh, secondary motion, um, and if it would make any difference, perhaps we commit to reviewing the process in six or nine months, so that a year from now, if we need to amend the rule or rescind it, uh, it's, it's it'll happen quicker. Um, Mr. Chair, I would support that as a friendly amendment. Well, so it would be two motions, uh, Trustee Stallings. The motion, yep. the first motion would be to approve the resolution as presented by staff. And then I would ask for another motion from the body for what Leah and I have just recommended. And can you restate that just so I have clarity? Sure. So the board would take an action on the resolution as presented. If it passes, uh, I would entertain a, a, another motion that the board review this action in nine months. In other words, that we have a, an agenda item on our. Yeah, it could be in six and nine or nine months, and I can't do the math right now very well myself. But January or March, and I. March. I identify that time frame because then if you decided you wanted to rescind the rule it could go out for public comment and be fully rescinded within 12 months right so at our march meeting to have an agenda item placed uh on you know on the board's agenda with a review of what has transpired up until that that point um and then if staff uh, sees that that the issues have been addressed then to introduce an item to release for public comment a rescission of the rule if if the facts support it can i just make one suggestion? sure of course i i would recommend it being at least march if not later only because we will only have a couple jenny meetings in the interim mm -hmm. time we only meet every other month and and also there are so many vacancies i don't know how much of a dent we'll be able to make in that short period of time in order to make a good assessment of this issue 
So split the baby a little bit and say at our May meeting, which is less than a year from now. I think that makes more sense. Is there a motion? Well, let's let's take care of Brandon's motion first. Any other discussion? I think we think we pretty well discussed this one out. Making sure there's nobody on the phone or on the Zoom who wants to. I see none. Madam, to, yes, Ms. Chair Duran, I just you know I agree with everything that um, uh, Mr. Cisneros offered as comment, and so I won't repeat it. Um, but I will just say, you know, I so I'm in full support of this, with the caveat that I would hope that at the outset of an investigation, the public members of the full Jenny Commission have an opportunity to weigh in with respect to what they would like to see explored as part of the investigation. Mm. Um, my experience with Jenny investigations is the commissioners spend a, do a ton of legwork talking to lawyers, talking to people who have um, submitted comments about the candidates. And so I think to make sure that the public members' voices are part of this, is to make sure they have a chance to weigh in on what are the issues they would like explored. Thank you. I'll make that recommendation to leadership. Too. Yeah, and I would suggest that given the conversation today and before, that is probably a view that is, if not universally held among among the the, the board, certainly by a great majority, um, especially those who've expressed an opinion. Okay, can we have a, a vote on the motion which stands on the screen as presented by staff? Broughton? 10? Yes. Cisneros? Aye. De La Cruz? Yes. Delenn? Yes. No? No. Seleg, um, absent. Shelby? No. Sol? No. Stallings? Yes. Tony? Nay. Five eyes, four no's, two absent. The motion carries. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Giving our previous discussion, is there a second motion? And this is Brandon. I will make that second motion as previously stated by the chair. So just to reiterate that is that this item be placed on uh, our May 2023 agenda for review. Correct. So is there a second to that motion? Second. Mr. Knoll, thank you. Any discussion? I think the staff has a pretty clear indication of our desire here. May we have the vote, please? Broughton? Chen? Yes. Cisneros? Aye. De La Cruz? Yes. Delenn? Yes. Knoll? Yes. Seleg? Absent. Shelby? Aye. Sol? Aye. Stallings? Yes. Tony? Aye. Nine ayes, zero nays, two absent. The motion carries. Thank you, Madam Secretary. That Let me just do a check. And everybody okay to keep, keep going or do we need a break? Looks like we're okay. Item 703 is uh, an item concerning the Client Trust Account Protection Program. This is a return from public comment and request to issue new rules for public comment. I show Ms. Wilson and or Mr. DeFrenturum. Yes, we are going to be presenting it together and I think uh, I am not controlling the slide deck. So, hi Randy. Good morning. Hey Randy. Good can, to see the, you. can the PowerPoint be put up? Randy, would you like me to do this or? Uh, sure, I thought Kelsey was gonna be online, but if you're available, that would be great, Louisa, I appreciate it. Uh, uh, Kelsey, I believe is here. Yes, I'm, I'm pulling up the slides. Yeah. Oh, okay. thank you. Can you view this okay? Yes, thanks. You can go ahead to the next slide. So this um, item has many parts, um, kind of like our, our parliamentary item. Um, and what we uh, hope to do today, Randy and I, is to give you a quick uh, overview of the public comments received on 
what I'm going to loosely call the CTOP implementing rules, as well as revisions to the rules of uh, professional conduct uh, governing client trust account management. And then we're going to move to what we're asking you to do today, which is uh, to accept a revision to and to adopt a new rule 1.4 uh, to discuss provo pro proposed revisions to and um, circulation of rule of court 9.85 and state bar rule 1.15 and to discuss proposed new state bar rule 2.5 uh, and request for public comment. And I'll just say that the rule of court 9.85 and the state bar rule 2.5 work together. Uh, one, the rule of court gives us the broad authority to implement the program sort of writ large. Uh, that authority is given us to us by the Supreme Court. Uh, rule 2.5 uh, reflects the state bars implementing rules, sort of the nitty gritty of how we're actually going to execute on our authority. Uh, so if you could advance the, the slide, Kelsey. All right, so we received 457 comments in total. And one of the things you'll notice if, when you look at these bullet points is that uh, for each, uh, with respect to Rule 9.85, uh, Rule 1.15, or Rule 1.4, we received more comments from non-attorneys than from attorneys. I am saying this without having actually um, undergone a deep uh, historical analysis, but I truly believe this is the first time that has ever happened. Um, and I think it is a testament to uh, just another aspect of our work to increase and elevate the public voice. And we're doing that through revised approaches to uh, issuing things for public comment, taking them out of legalese, putting them in plain language, and pushing out uh, the rule, the comment period notices onto social media. So this really surprised uh, me when I, when I saw this. If you could advance the slide. So um, comments in support, uh, primarily submitted by non-attorney commenters, uh, that's not surprising. So you can just see for each of the rules in question, uh, whether you have attorneys or non-attorneys who's agreeing or disagreeing with the various uh, proposals. You can go forward. Um, opposing positions. There's a general broad opposition to the client trust account protection program itself. Overly burdensome, not going to protect uh, uh, us or the public from the Girardi uh, type of actor and then a concern that compliance uh, will increase operating costs for lawyers and they will in turn have to pass those costs on to their clients. In support, um, we heard, I think, uh, what you would expect, increased accountability and transparency and appreciation for making public the expectations around the time frame for distribution of the funds. Um, and then some personal stories about how rules like this would have helped uh, would have helped people in their own um, matters. And I do wanna say that there were attorneys actually offering uh, positions in support. Um, it wasn't all 100% a universal opposition. And some of those attorneys also commented that this would help them in their practice, this kind of clarity. So if we could go forward, Randy's now gonna walk you through the nuts and bolts of the rule revisions. Thank you, Leah. So what the Special Audit Discipline Committee noticed is that there are certain areas in the lawyer's duties regarding the handling of client trust funds that could be clarified and strengthened. And one of them was the communication rule, uh, Rule of Professional Conduct 1-1.4, uh, 1 which provides that lawyers must uh, proactively communicate with clients to keep them reasonably informed about significant developments. And that rule does not define what is a significant development, uh, but comment one does state um, that it's anything that would not be insignificant. And what we did when we put out for public comment is that we added a reference to an example. Uh, we said that a lawyer's receipt of funds is a significant development for purposes of this rule. And so it would trigger the duty to proactively communicate. We also included a cross-reference to two provisions in the trust accounting rule 1.15 that deal with the duty 
to give notice of the fact of receipt of funds and also the duty to provide a reasonable accounting. So we added that cross-reference to connect the dots between the communication rule and the trust accounting rule as it pertains to keeping your client informed about funds that the lawyer is handling. We received comment back on the communication rule uh, indicating that the statement we included as an example in the comment uh, was stated unequivocally as an absolute, that in every case, a lawyer's receipt of funds would be a significant development. And upon a review, uh, we attend, uh, staff uh, agreed with the commenter that uh, this should be qualified. Uh, the rule really is a significant development trigger and so there could be, depending on the context and circumstances, a de minimis situation. And so what we've done is revise the comment language to qualify the statement that ordinarily a lawyer's receipt of funds is a significant development. And because we didn't want that ordinarily qualifier to affect the cross-reference, we sort of rejiggered the language a little bit to make it clear that the duties under the trust accounting rule to give prompt notice of receipt, to provide a reasonable accounting, that those are uh, absolute uh, requirements, uh, but that under the communication rule, the duty to proactively communicate that client informed is really a, a generalized standard and ordinarily is going to be a significant uh, development. And this is the rule that uh, staff is recommending following consideration of public comment that the board adopt and submit to the Supreme Court for approval. And I don't want to move on to the other rules. All the rest of the rules are just going out for additional comment or comment for the first time. But I'm happy to take any questions on this rule, which again is the one rule that we're recommending for adoption. Thank you, Randy. Any questions in the room for either Randy or Leah? Don't see any, any questions uh, from folks on the phone or on Zoom. Okay, seeing none. Uh, next slide, please. Leah mentioned the rule of court. This is a proposed new rule of court. It functions as an enabling rule. And so as Leah was describing, it generally authorizes the creation of program. It does not directly impose the duties, the reporting, the registration, the must take a self-assessment. Those are things that are uh, part of the state bar's execution or implementation and why we have developed a new state bar rule, proposed new rule 2.5. But when we looked at the comment on the enabling rule, we did see that there were some things that uh, could be clarified. And so we've added some headings, captions throughout the rule. Uh, we have also addressed the fact that there might be some definitional issues. And so the enabling rule now specifically says that in adopting state bar rules to implement the program, that we can include some definitional topics. We also are looking to have the operation of the CTAP uh, reporting and registration requirements mirror the enforcement that occurs when, for example, a lawyer fails to comply with their MCLE requirements, that there would be voluntary uh, administrative and active status that's imposed, and that there might be fees uh, for untimely compliance and to get reinstated. And so we did add to the rule of court specific provision that the state bar has the authority to set and collect appropriate fees and penalties. Uh, with these changes, we are asking that it be put out for uh, another 45 day public comment period. Uh, because of these changes, and also because we think the public should get a chance to look at it side by side with the more detailed state bar rule, the proposed new rule 2.5, that has a lot more of the details, including some definitions. But again, I'll stop here and see if there's any questions on the enabling rule, the rule of court that would authorize this program. Uh, we are asking that it go out for another round of public comment. Thank you, Randy. Any questions in the room? Seeing none, any questions? Uh, remotely. Seeing none, okay, Randy, next. Thank you. Uh, next slide, please. This is the second proposed amended rule of professional conduct that the Special Audit Discipline Committee felt could be strengthened and clarified to enhance the lawyer's compliance with their duties. And in particular, there were two things that the uh, uh, proposal uh, made in terms of uh, major changes to the rule as it went up for public comment. 
The first one is to the duty to give notice that uh, funds have been received. That duty currently reads that an attorney must promptly inform a client about funds received. Uh, that has been changed to a proposal that unless there is good cause, the, the lawyer must uh, give notice of receipt of funds no later than 14 days. And so we've gotten rid of some of the ambiguity about what is meant by promptly. And we've established a, a hard deadline of 14 days. That's a good cause, of course, to inform your client of the simple fact that funds have been received. And again, the, the, the language in the new comment 1.4 will cross-reference this. Um, there were no changes to that following public comment. And so that stands as it was issued. What we did change is that um, the rule was enhanced with regard to the duty to promptly disperse funds to which a client or other person becomes entitled. That was also under this general standard of promptly. But what was added in going up for public comment was a presumed violation if the lawyer does not distribute the funds within 45 days when the funds become basically free and clear, that there's no lien dispute, there's no other prior attorney dispute or any other issue holding up the lawyer's disbursement of the funds. And so that 45 day bright line was intended to trigger a presumed violation. And we did have great assistance from COPRAC in drafting these up uh, from the Special Audit Discipline Committee. And when they did submit it uh, to the board, they did note that while we were creating a presumed violation, we really hadn't addressed how the respondent could rebut the presumption and what would happen in the case of the presumption being rebutted. So what we have added um, to the rule and why we're asking that it go out for an additional public comment is language addressing the rebuttal of the presumption. And what we've done is added to new paragraph F that this rebuttable presumption may be rebutted by proof by a preponderance of evidence that there was good cause for not distributing the funds within 45 days. Basically, the funds became clear. And we added a comment, new comment five, that clarifies that upon rebuttal by proof by a preponderance of the evidence that the rebuttable presumption in paragraph F, uh, that the uh, Office of Chief Trial Counsel must establish by clear and convincing evidence without the benefit of a rebuttal presumption, the fact of a violation if they choose to pursue it. In other words, if the respondent rebuts the presumption, it does not negate any culpability, it just restores the status quo. And if OCTC wants to proceed with it, they can, they just would not have the benefit of the presumption. Uh, one other change, and all of these changes are documented and explained in agenda item. I'll just mention one other with 1.15, is that when it came to the concept of undisputed funds, uh, which is defined uh, in 1.15, the way it was worded in the original public comment proposal is, is that it could have been construed to suggest that it's basically an all of nothing proposition. That if the settlement came in, that proceed as a whole was either disputed or undisputed when the reality, and we hear it on the hotline all the time, is that portions of what a lawyer receives might be subject to dispute and other portions would be undisputed. And so what we've done is we clarified rule 1.15 to say that when we're defining what is undisputed and should be distributed to the client within 45 days or else the presumed violation will occur, is any portion of funds. Um, so it's often not gonna be the whole. I'll stop there and again, ask if there's any questions about the changes we've made to enhance rule 1.15. Uh, we are asking that it go out for an additional 45 day public comment, particularly because we've made major changes such as how the presumption is rebutted. Thank you, Randy. I don't see any questions in the room. Any questions remotely? Okay, there are none. Oh, Next. Well, this is the last one. And this is a new one. This was not part of what the board issued uh, when it first considered the CTAP implementation steps. This is the new uh, state bar rule 2.5, which is intended to be really the rule that stands up the program. Uh, the rule of court authorizes it, but to actually impose on the licensees 
the duties uh, that are in phase one of the CTAP program, the reporting of whether you have a trust account, uh, the certification that you're knowledgeable and compliant with Rule 1.15, and the actual registration of account information, and the possibility of other compliance reviews, taking of a self-assessment. The state bar rule is where all of those details occur. And so we have some definitions. Um, we have uh, clarification as to what is the reportable time period, what are the deadlines, uh, what happens when you receive a notice of compliance, the administrative uh, inactive enrollment, uh, the provision for non-compliance fees, and then reinstatement following non-compliance. And so many of the details that you don't find in the rule of court are in the proposed uh, rule 2.5. And I wanna give a uh, shout out, if you will, to the assistance from OGC staff, uh, Suzanne, and also ARCA staff, Dina, who helped me in reviewing uh, the state bar rules and finding uh, language that uh, can be adapted for this purpose. Much of what's in this rule is almost verbatim from other state bar rules, such as the MCLE rules that are used uh, for uh, putting someone on administrative inactive and then restoring them after the appropriate fees. And so that's what we have in state bar rule 2.5. The main thing I wanna note here is that this rule is dependent upon the Supreme Court's promulgation of the enabling rule of court. And so the authority to have this rule and stand up the program will follow from the court's approval of 9.8.5. So when this comes back to the board for actual adoption, it will only happen after 9.8.5 is approved by the court. Now, one thing we've done in the past when we submit uh, provisions to the court is if they contemplate authority for the board to promulgate rules that we might even include in that rule filing the rules that were planning to adopt. And so long ago uh, in the late 80s when the rules of professional conduct were revised to authorize the board to adopt standards regarding presumed violations of the advertising rules, when that amendment to the advertising rule went up to the court, we actually included what the board had in mind for its first set of advertising standards. So that's why we have accelerated the process and we've come up with our actual state bar rule because when we do see fit to submit the proposed rule of court, we think the court would be greatly informed by seeing what we had in mind for the implementation rule. Um, any questions on 2.5? Trustees, any questions? No questions, Randy, please proceed. I think we've now reached the point where we've covered the, the rules. Again, three of them are for public comment and one of them is for adoption. But one for adoption is the communication rule where we did not change the rule proper, the black letter. We only uh, improved the comment by, uh, again, cross-referencing reporting obligations in the trust County rule and stating that ordinarily receipt of funds is an example of a significant development. But that is actually the the main action in terms of uh, a rule being adopted today. It's just rule 1.4, the rest are for public comment. Thank you, Randy. Just one uh, point of clarification. The resolution as presented on the screen, at least here shows uh, a rad action. This is obviously the Board of Trustees action. So I'm, I'm gonna assume that's just a, a clerical error and we can make the, the fix here uh, prior to the motion. Well, I think Kelsey, if you pull down the slide deck, Louisa will just share the resolutions. Ah, because okay. This is so this was from a presentation. Yeah. Deck, yeah. Great. So we'll ask the secretary to put the motion for the board of trustees on the screen. While that's happening, um, let me just open the floor to to discussion, debate, or questions um, from any of the trustees here in the room or virtually. Trustee Tony, please. I just want to say how impressed I am and that I really appreciate the staff make uh, responding to public comment by making what appear to be very um, thoughtful uh, changes and recommendations. And I, I, I think this is great to send back out one more time, um, you know, with all the changes to see if there's anything else left that, because um, 
this is an enormous change. This is an enormous, and um, we, we want to do everything we can to get it right. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Before I ask for a motion, I will just echo um, Trustee Tony's sentiments and and uh, point out that this is uh, this is public protection. Um, I want to say at its finest. I mean the the, the thoroughness with which uh, the staff and uh, everyone who worked on these proposed rules and the ones that are going forward. Um, is is incredibly impressive. It's a lot of work that's been done. That's been very clear. The attention to detail on the cross references, um, and I'm sure there was a lot of discussion with uh, Office of Chief Trial Counsel to make sure these are rules that can be uh, can be appropriately uh, disciplined, uh, used for discipline. All of that in response to you know to things that we uh, we learned. Uh, in some very difficult ways over over many months. So kudos and thank you to everyone. Can I have a motion on the resolution as presented, please? I'll make the motion. Motion by Cisneros. Delen seconds. Second Delen. Seeing no further debate, can we have the vote? Broughton. Chen. Yes. Cisneros. Aye. De La Cruz. Yes. Delen. Yes. No. Yes. Seleg? Yes, yes, please. Shelby? Aye. So? Aye. Stallings? Yes. Tony? Aye. Nine ayes, zero nays, one absent. The motion carries. Thank you, Madam Secretary. It is 11 o'clock. Why don't we take a 10 minute uh, break and come back here at 10, I'm sorry, 11.10. Thank you. Past the appointed hour, and I will reconvene the meeting of the Board of Trustees. Madam Secretary, I believe we have everybody present, or at least a quorum. We do. Trustees who are attending remotely, um, if you turn on your camera, then we'll be able to see you, but we do have a quorum. Okay, thank you. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, and again, thank you for the, the hard work this morning. We're going to move on to item 7. Zero four, the proposed adoption of consumer alert for disciplinary actions in other jurisdictions. Chief Child Counsel Cardona, please. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so this is an item that uh, was originally before the board in May, um, and at the time um, uh, it was postponed um, and put off to uh, July to enable additional work. Um, and make some modifications in accordance with comments that were made at the May meeting. Um, board member Seleg um, and uh, Vice Chair Stallings um, were designated and I worked with them on modifications. Um, we're now returning with the item um, and to refresh everybody's recollection, this is in response, this was generated as a response to one of the state audit recommendations. Um, when they looked at discipline in other jurisdictions and uh, recommended that we should notify the public on our website when other jurisdictions have determined that an attorney who is also licensed in California presents a substantial threat of harm to the public. And so we put together a proposed set of consumer alerts. Um, the primary changes between the last uh, item and this one are to modify uh, the proposal such that consumer alerts um, will now be placed um, when another jurisdiction has um, imposed discipline only if that discipline is a suspension or disbarment. Um, if the other jurisdiction has imposed other discipline, we will only put up a notation um, on the license page of that fact uh, together with a link to that discipline and then also a disclaimer. Um, um, and then the only other consumer alert would be, would be when another jurisdiction has um, imposed an interim suspension or involuntary inactive status or its equivalent uh, pending that jurisdiction's final determination regarding discipline because those types of interim actions typically require a showing um, in accordance with the state auditor's recommendation um, that there is a substantial threat of harm. So we believe that this modified uh, proposal um, accords with the state auditor's recommendation while also more limiting the circumstances in which consumer alerts will be posted 
primarily to those circumstances where there's a suspension or disbarment if the other jurisdiction has imposed discipline. In attachment B um, uh, to the agenda item, we provided a mock-up of what the consumer alerts and notices would look like um, in each of the four circumstances that we're seeking um, approval from the board to post those. Um, so with that, um, I'll see if there are any questions, comments. Thank you, Mr. Cardona. Are there any questions here in the room? For those of you who are following along at home, if you'd like to see uh, those mock-ups, they begin on page nine of the agenda item. I, th I appreciate uh, seeing that. It's very helpful. Any questions I just, from... I I'm have sorry, a question. Trustee Chen, go ahead. Um, just wanted some clarification. The disclaimer talks about a decision not being final if something is on appeal. Is that... Is that typically how things work, including in other jurisdictions? Is if something is still reviewable or appealable, it's not considered final? Yes, most other jurisdictions have some form. It's it won't it doesn't typically take the same form that our type of review by the review department takes. But most other jurisdictions have um, either review by the board as a whole or some other review mechanism before it becomes final. Okay, thank. You. Any other questions? Comments? Okay. Uh, Chair. Yes, Dylan, go ahead. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm How sorry, Trustee you Dylan. Your, your audio is, is very choppy. I apologize. We, we didn't really catch anything you said. Okay. Um, and can you, can you hear now? We can hear you, yes. It, it might help if you cut your video. Okay. How often do we get other just get information from other jurisdictions? I, I think she was asking how often we get these types of notices from other jurisdictions. And how do you get them, yeah. And how do we get them? Um, so we get them in a number of different ways. <laughs> Um, we can get um, complaints filed by individuals who learn of disciplinary action in another jurisdiction. Um, we can get referrals from the other jurisdiction, which may send us notice that they've imposed discipline on another attorney. And we also um, are signed up with the ABA, um, the American Bar Association, which one of their arms uh, maintains a database of discipline imposed on attorneys, um, and so we have the ability to access that database and see if attorneys who have received discipline in other jurisdictions who are also California licensed. And indeed, we are signed up with that database to get notices um, sent to us um, when the ABA learns of discipline in another jurisdiction on a l attorney who their database indicates is licensed in California. Um, so those are among the ways we get notice. We also may see media reports or other things, and that's another source. Um, in terms of frequency, um, uh, this is not the most common of the violations we get, but it, it does occur with some frequency. It's not, I wouldn't characterize it as infrequent. Does that answer the questions? Trustee Dillon, I want to make sure your question was answered. It could be that she uh, she had to jump off. If she comes back and needs more information, I'm sure she'll make herself known. Any other questions from any of the trustees? Okay, seeing none, is there a resolution for the board to consider? Resolutions on the screen, trustees. If there are no changes, I will entertain a motion to approve as presented, please. This is Brandon. I'd make the motion. I'll second. I'll make. We have a motion by Vice Chair Stallings, a second by Trustee Chen. May we have the vote? Broughton? Chen? Yes. Cisneros? Aye. De La Cruz? Yes. Delenn? No. Trustee No.
Sestinol. I, I see your Sorry, mother. sorry, okay. I was mu I was muted. Yeah, yes, please. Thank you. Salag? Um, sorry, can I ask a question? I was dropped off uh, for a moment. Is this, is, is this the proposal that was in the agenda materials unchanged? That is correct. Okay, thank you. I vote yes. Shelby? Aye. Sol? Aye. Stallings? Yes. Tony? Aye. Nine ayes, zero noes, two absent. The motion carries. Thank you. Before we leave that item, let me just uh, offer a word of thanks to trustees Seleg and Stallings for working with the Chief Trial Counsel on, on that item. Appreciate it. The next item uh, is also Mr. Cardona's. That is the update on the response to the state audit. So there is a PowerPoint. We'll get the PowerPoint up on the screen. Okay, so um, uh, just to take you back, this is an update on the state audit. Um, these were the recommendations. We've shown this slide before with our previous updates. Um, there were recommendations in a series of categories um, that are reflected here. Uh, the numbers on those relate to uh, the numbering that the state auditor has been using um, when we submit um, interim reports to them to identify the recommendations in our action. So um, as of May 19th, which was the last update, this is where we were. As you can see, um, a number of items had already been completed on the left, but the vast majority of items remained to be done. Um, the July deadline was one that the state auditor set for most of their recommendations. There were some recommendations that were uh, recommended to be completed by later dates in October and April. Um, since that time, um, these are the things we've done. We submitted um, our 60-day update on implementation on June 10th. Um, we then responded to various follow-up questions from the state auditor. Um, in addition, we've implemented a number of other recommendations. So OCTC has implemented a new policy and some procedures um, on conflicts that now require conflict checks to be done by our investigators and attorneys, um, both at case assignment and then again prior to closing. Um, and that accords, we believe, with the state auditor's recommendations. In addition, the State Bar's um, IT department um, worked to integrate our conflict of interest database, which is a form that all State Bar employees use to indicate attorneys with whom they have potential conflicts, to integrate that with our case management system, Odyssey, um, and to check and sort out and confirm and make sure that Odyssey is now communicating with the conflict of interest database and that the information in our case management system regarding conflicts is accurate. Um, that work was completed June 30th, 2022. There is a second phase of that work that remains ongoing, which is further um, corrections and checking um, and some uh, additional implementation of conflict stuff. But the bulk of that was completed as of June 30th, so that will now work. Um, we've revised our closing letters for both client trust account related complaints and bank reportable actions, which are um, reports from banks on insufficient funds activity in client trust accounts um, to include resource information. That is now every letter that goes out closing one of those types of actions includes resource information on um, client trust account related resources, how to manage client trust accounts, um, other information that attorneys can use um, in the hope of um, uh, assisting in better management of those accounts to avoid uh, similar instances in the future. We also issued an updated policy that precludes us from engaging of closures of bank reportable actions that involve low dollar values, what are referred to as de minimis closures. Um, if the attorney has a pending or prior bank reportable action or client trust account related complaint um, within the last two years, um, that again accords with one of the state auditor's recommendations. Um, finally, we also modified our policy relating to our twice a year random audit of closed files. 
um, to increase the independence of the external auditor, ensuring that that is now uh, managed by ARIA as opposed to our office, um, that uh, the external auditor is the one who works with ARIA on the selection of those cases, um, and also providing for us to do more detailed reporting to the board on how we implement and comply with the recommendations of the auditor. Um, so you'll be seeing us come back to you um, at the uh, report on the next audit um, with more detailed timelines um, for our reporting to the board on implementation of recommendations. Um, finally, with respect to recommendations regarding investigations of client trust account related complaints and bank reportable actions that are not de minimis, um, we are in the process of implementing a pilot program which will take effect August 1st um, to handle some subset of those cases in accordance with the state auditor's recommendations. So in particular, um, these are our bank reportable actions and client trust account case filings over the last five years. As you can see, there are rather significant numbers of each. Um, after some analysis, um, looking at the number of bank RAs that end at the intake stage, 80% um, of those are non-de minimis. 20% um, are, are de minimis but had a prior. Um, those cases are now ones that will be, um, or under the state auditor's criteria, should be um, further investigated rather than closed in intake. Um, and the total number of additional CTA cases on a three-year average. So this gives us an estimate of how many cases are going to be um, in the pilot program. What we're going to do is take a random sample of those, assign those to a pilot team that is going to apply the state auditor's uh, method of investigation. The balance will continue to be handled the way we are. Um, the goals are to get some comparative data to see if, in fact, the state auditor's recommendations make sense and that we should be doing that as opposed to handling them the way we are now. Um, so basically, we're going to be, um, this is an estimate of the number of FTE needed for investigators, four attorneys, two paralegals, two administrative support, and <clears throat> half of a principal anal analyst in ORIA to do the data analysis. Um, this was an estimate of the cost. Um, we do not have that money yet or the additional positions yet, but we are going ahead and proceeding with the pilot program. Um, effective August 1st, we expect that the pilot program will run for six months. What we have done is designated one of our trial teams as the pilot team. Um, they're being relieved of other assignments during the six-month pilot program period um, and will be receiving the random case assignments from ORIA. Um, in addition to looking at a comparison of how they come out, we'll also do demographic analysis um, to see if there is a, um, if there are differences in um, how outcomes based on any correlations with demographic um, groups over the time period of the pilot program. Um, so we have this in place. We've worked with ARIA. Um, the first random selection of cases will occur. Um, uh, the week of August 1st, those will be assigned to the pilot program, um, and we will be off and running to see how this comes out. So this is the revised timeline. As you can see, um, we've now completed um, most of what needed to be done by July. Um, today, we completed one more of those, which will now move to the left, which is the consumer alert for disciplinary actions in other jurisdictions. Um, still pending um, with the hope that we will get it done in July, but I have talked to the state auditor um, and advised them that that may be delayed a little bit beyond July is an operational report to implement the uh, complaint categorization, um, which is the creation of a spreadsheet that our attorneys can use to see when attorneys have prior complaints falling into particular categories. Um, that is in progress. It may not be done by the end of July, but if not, it will be done shortly after. And then the pilot project will begin August 1st. Um, so on the far right are the things that are still remaining, um, which again will be within the time frame set by the state auditor. Um, so I believe we are on a, a good track to complete um, the recommendations of the state auditor within the time frames they set. Um, and obviously we will continue our periodic reporting to the state auditor in accordance with their requirements. So that is the update. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Cardona? Uh, Trustee Stallings. Hey, thank you so much for your work on this. Um, definitely a lot of 
man hours are going into this or individual hours are going into this. Um, my question relates to the um, Farkas report and then Robertson recommendations. To what extent, if any, were we able to implement any of those uh, findings or recommendations into a path forward regarding these RAs? So we are keeping in place um, the recommendations that were in place. So we haven't changed. In other words, we've kept in the possibility for de minimis closures. We've limited that, however, in accordance with the state auditor's recommendation um, based on an analysis of their prior histories. In terms of looking at prior histories, we've kept in place the recommendation that uh, complaints that were closed more than five years ago remain archived, so those will remain archived and those won't be looked at typically um, in assessing prior history. Um, so to that extent, we've complied. The other piece that we're including to try and see if there is anything um, that implicates the Farkas and Robertson recommendations is ARIA looking at um, both the pilot program and non-pilot program in a variety of demographic uh, characteristics to see if the shift to how the state auditor wants us to do things um, has any adverse demographic effects on any particular groups. So that'll be part of the pilot program study. Thank you. Thank you, Brandon. Any other questions? Trustee Tony. I appreciate um, this report and all the work that's been done, and it's presented in a very clear fashion, and I appreciate that. I have a couple questions. One is, um, I understand the concept of de minimis, but I don't know how the de minimis, uh, just tell me how much it is, like what's uh, below? $50. And what's above? 50, thank you, that's all. For, for, for me and maybe other people in the public, just adding that little thing in there might be helpful. I know it's okay. helpful to me because I don't know. Okay, so thank you. And my second question was more, it doesn't require an answer right now, but I like the fact that on slide nine that you included overhead in addition to the FTEs when you're calculating the cost. And my, my only question, it, it, it relates to a discussion we had yesterday on the fees, uh, the fees discussion. And I'm just curious if the fees on the, um, if the overhead was calculated the same way. It's just a question. And yeah. Yes, it's a standard methodology for the whole organization. Excellent, thank you very much. Thank, uh, I, those are my only questions, thank you. Thank you, Trustee Tony. Any other comments or questions for Mr. Cardona? Just echoing the thanks that have already been the thanks that have already been expressed. A lot of work, important to respond to that that audit, and we appreciate your continued efforts. We're almost done. We will be back. Knock on wood. Yes, we will be back. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Schwarzenegger. Okay. That takes us, if, uh, if the board doesn't mind, I'd like to switch around the agenda a little bit and uh, leapfrog over item 706 so that we can uh, discuss item 707 to some scheduling issues. This is the elimination of the five-year period of validity for passing bar exam scores, a request to circulate for public comment. Uh, Donna Hershkowitz. Good and morning. Good morning. Uh, and if we could promote Mr. David Torres. Oh, he's yep. on the screen. Wonderful. Uh, not my scheduling issue. <laughs> Welcome, Mr. Torres. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Uh, so good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Donna Hershkowitz, obviously, your chief of programs. And today I have with me David Torres, who is a member of the Committee of Bar Examiners. Um, and we're here today to get the board's approval to circulate for public comment changes to state bar rules, which currently require that an applicant for admission to the bar meet all of the requirements for cert meet all of the requirements for certification at the Supreme Court and get sworn in within five years after the date of the exam of the bar exam that they passed. Um, briefly stated, this proposal would eliminate that timeline, um, but would in its place require that if an applicant takes more than five years to get sworn in, that they must renew their moral character determination. 
when we first broached this issue um, with when we broached the concept of this with the committee of bar examiners and we had asked for volunteers to work with staff to help develop the proposal flesh it out and come up with the recommendations um, Mr. Torres as well as committee member Robbie uh, Robbie Brody volunteered and worked closely with me on this item helped me present the item to the committee of bar examiners and Mr. Torres uh, uh, has found some room in his incredibly hectic schedule to join us here today and help me with this presentation. Mr. Brody offers his apologies. Um, he has a couple of his colleagues who are out with COVID and he needs to cover. Um, so he won't be able to join us. And um, as brief background before I turn it over to Mr. Torres, I just want to note that we are engaging in a um, comprehensive review of all of the admissions rules. Um, but we got a jump start with the rule that is the subject matter of this agenda item as a result of an inquiry that came in regarding an applicant whose request for an extension of the five year timeline was denied. And in examining whether, in examining the process that we followed, did we follow all, all our rules? Did we treat the applicant fairly? Were, were there any delays that were on the part of the state bar staff that caused it to be more than five years? In doing that analysis, we realized that that's not even the proper question. The proper question really is, um, why do we have the rule? Is the rule necessary in the first place? How does the rule further public protection? Does it further public protection? Ultimately, um, uh, staff and then the committee of bar, bar examiners concluded that it doesn't further, further public protection and uh, are thus recommending the change that we're bringing, bringing to you today. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to um, Mr. Torres, uh, member of the Committee of Bar Examiners, to um, walk through some of the changes for you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, I previously served as a member of this board, the Board of Trustees, from 2012 to 2015. I believe I was appointed to serve as liaison with the Committee of Bar Examiners back in 2013, and I've been a part of that organization since and uh, now this is an issue that's been lingering for quite some time and I recall it was lingering when I was a member of the uh, board of trustees but again it's a question that always pop that pops up from time to time it doesn't happen too often but uh, uh, as she mentioned is whether or not we should uh, remove a person or uh, require that an individual who is uh, not uh, sworn an oath to the uh, California State Bar, whether that person should in fact uh, be required to take the bar exam again. And again, you, you, you may be able to wonder why it might bother an individual, but, uh, but we have to wonder, does this protect public protection? And after discussing this at length, we believe that it doesn't protect um, uh, or doesn't further public protection. And we were talking about reasons why. And we're thinking about that and thinking, well, let's assume that an individual went off and uh, uh, decided to uh, suspend, not suspend his license, well, suspend his license for a couple of years. So perhaps he wanted to engage in some other type of profession, but then he ultimately begin, does re return to the practice of law. The fact that this person has been out for you know, three, maybe five years, does that mean that he's lost his minimum competence of practicing law? or uh, somebody, uh, for example, decides to take the bar, the person passes the bar, five years has gone by, but that person is perhaps practicing law in another state, which is what we see quite often in these situations. And having practiced in a, another state, they forget about it, but later on decide that I'm going to go ahead and take, a, 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 take my oath for the California bar. So again, does this in fact uh, hinder uh, public protection? Again, we don't believe it does. Because again, once that, that person does take the bar exam, that person does show us that that person does possess the minimum competency to practice law in the state of California. And um, again, some of the requirements that they may not have co completed was a moral, uh, moral character, but all we need to do is reactivate that and take it again. We have to take it and, and we can complete it. If they if they uh, have it comported as they should, then obviously we will catch it and, and re-examine re uh, it at that particular time. So uh, with regard to that, I were asking uh, this board to carefully examine uh, what we've done uh, 
for over the past uh, well for quite some time now, and we believe that uh, uh, this would possibly be the best route to take. And I think one of the um, one of the factors that um, was most convincing for the uh, members of the committee of bar examiners was looking at how we treat licensed attorneys versus how we treat those who have passed the bar exam but have not yet gotten and have met all of the other eligibility requirements for admission but have chosen for one reason or another not to get sworn in. And we realized that we're, we are um, posing a hurdle for those who have met all the requirements, have, um, uh, have passed the bar exam, um, but yet have not sort of finalized that step by taking taking the very last step of getting sworn in because as Mr. Torres indicated, maybe they uh, the job that they took um, in California doesn't require bar licensure at the time and they didn't want to spend the money on the um, licensing fees. Maybe they are li they are licensed in another state where they're practicing. Suddenly they realize the time is running running short or they are moving to California and they do need a bar licensure. Um, whereas if you know, I went inactive as a, an attorney and I were inactive for five years. The only difference between me and the person who passed the bar exam and met all the other requirements and didn't get sworn in is that I've been paying licensing fees for the past five years. And that's certainly not a reason to make that kind of a distinction. So that's why we're recommending elimination of the rule. What we are uh, also recommending, as uh, Mr. Torres alluded to at the end of his presentation, um, is that <clears throat> for those who have been certified to the Supreme Court as having met all of the um, all of the requirements for admission, um, but don't get sworn in within the five year period, they they can't automatically get sworn back in again um, under what we're proposing. We, they would be decertified um, uh, from the Supreme from the Supreme Court so that they would have the opportunity or the requirement um, to ensure that we extend their positive moral character determination. So we would have the, the obligation to, uh, to update, um, they would have the obligation to update their moral character application um, from uh, the, the date of the last application to the, this, to the current date, whether that's, that's five and a half years away, whether it's 10 years away, 15 years, they'll update it for that period of time will determine that they continue to possess the requisite moral character and then um, and then they would be recertified to the Supreme Court and be eligible um, for, for getting sworn in again. We think that this is a fair and rational and reasonable consistent way to treat those who have demonstrated their minimum competence um, and satisfied all requirements for admission and therefore we request that the board authorize us to put this out for a 45 day public comment. Thank you, Ms. Herskowitz, Mr. Torres, uh, both of you. Any questions for uh, our presenters today? Okay, just a reminder, this is to put out for public comment. This will come back to the board after uh, that uh, very reasonable period. Uh, if I could just take an opportunity to, to say thank you. Oh, okay, I saw that uh, Mr. Seleg's hand was raised, I missed it, but I did want to thank um, Mr. Torres both for your service on the on the board in the past, but especially for your service on the CBE um, ever since then, and most especially over the past couple of years, which I know has been a very challenging time for the Committee of Bar Examiners and dealing with the effects of the pandemic and, and all of those uh, very stressful test takers. So thank you for that, for that very hard uh, work that I know very often goes un, un, uh, unlauded, and so. That's wanted to make that comment. Uh, Trustee Seleg has uh, something to add, please. Oh, thanks, Ruben. So, um, uh, so this is a good proposal. Thanks for the presentation. Um, I think it's a well taken idea. Um, Donna, I think a question for you. Um, as I think about it, the, the existing five year period seems like a very long time for the moral character determination to be sitting around because a lot can happen in five years. So. Is there is that something separate from this proposal that that ought to be revisited? Whether whether that should have a shorter shelf life. So typically, a moral character determination has a three year um, validity period. Um, the um, the current rule says that the it's valid for three years, or until you are certified to the Supreme Court. 
And so once they meet all the admissions requirements, including moral character, they're certified to the Supreme Court, and then they have five years to get sworn in. So there is a, a slight inconsistency there, um, but they are required, um, all applicants are required until they, until they get sworn in to um, uh, keep the Office of Admissions apprised of any issues which would affect their moral character. They have a 30-day requirement to provide notice to the Office of Admissions of any changes that might impact the moral character. Um, it, it's certainly something that we actually thought about, Mr. Seleg, as we were putting together this proposal um, that, um, you know, sh should, should we say you get decertified after three years instead of after five years to match that period. Um, but because the current process um, up until now has allowed you to have that full five years and get sworn in, um, we didn't feel like this was the time to lessen um, that requirement, but it absolutely could be something that we consider as we are reviewing all of the, um, uh, all of the other admissions rules. Um, the moral character rules, frankly, are going to be among the first batch of rules that are going to be ready to look at. Um, and so uh, you might be seeing those sooner rather than later. Okay. Yeah, I think it is worth looking at. And if I understand you correctly, I, this is probably quite rare, but theoretically, someone could be sworn in eight years after the moral character process was completed, right? <laughs> because the, it's, the moral character is good for three years. And then once they're certified in the Supreme Court, that's another five-year clock. It's five years from the date that you passed, from the last day of the bar exam that you passed. So oh, I see. Okay. So if you, so if the moral character is the very last thing that you that you do, um, you will have passed the bar exam before that. So there is a, it's it's not going. It couldn't be eight years. Got it. Okay. Yeah, I still think it's worth looking at whether we ought to tighten that up, and um, also whether you know, for example after a certain after a shorter period of time maybe the fingerprints have to be run again which is would be a pretty simple thing to do so those are just some ideas for study not to act on today yes and during that five-year period we do um have uh, i do i believe we ha we continue to maintain the subsequent arrest notification during that five-year period so right. we are getting updates if there are um if there are convictions or other issues that affect the moral character and we can um we do have a process for being able to uh, revoke the positive determination and reopen the investigation of moral character. Ah, uh, okay, that's all good. Thank you. And, and I think it's important to note that we don't have very many. I think there's only been what, Donna, nine over the past uh, few years, but if we that- get a, Yeah, we get about roughly, uh, we've had between 10 and, 10 and 15 requests annually um, for folks who are, over the five years, um, some of whom have been previously certified to the Supreme Court, and that's the five-year clock that's run, some of whom um, haven't yet been certified because they were waiting, they passed the bar exam, but were waiting to do their moral character until, they real, uh, uh, until such time as they thought they would need their bar licensure. Because again, they were practicing in another state, they, um, they had a job that didn't require it, so they hadn't gotten their moral character. Um, so. So, so, and I don't have the breakdown, but you know, it's less than it's less than that small number every year that we have. Some some percentage of that have been sworn in and have that have had their moral character um, in existence for at least five years. Um, but um, yeah, it's sort of it's we're looking at two different populations right. here that that we're dealing with. Thank you for those points, Sean, and the responses, Donna and Mr. Torres. Any other uh, questions or comments? Seeing none, I will entertain a motion and ask the secretary to thank you. There it is. Here it comes. There's the proposed resolutions as presented by staff. If there are uh, no proposed amendments, can we get a motion, please? I'll make the motion. I'll second. I missed who made the motion. De La Cruz. Ah, thank you, Juan. Motion by De La Cruz, second by I... Shelby. If we could have a roll, please. Broughton, Chen? Yes. Cisneros? Aye. De La Cruz? Yes. Delenn? Yes. No?
No? Yes. Thank you. Slug? Yes. Shelby? Aye. So? Aye. Stallings? Yes. Tony? Aye. Nine ayes, zero nays, one absent. The motion carries. Thank you. Thank, thank you all. And I just want to take the opportunity to once again thank Mr. Torres and Mr. Brody, who couldn't be with us today, for engaging in these uh, extra efforts outside of all of the work that they do in CBE to assist uh, me in developing the proposal and doing the presentations and really sort of um, becoming cheerleaders for, um, for these changes that we're proposing. Absolutely. Thank you all. Good luck next week, everybody, by the way. Okay, that takes us to item back up to item 706, I believe the number is. Uh, this item is approval of interest on lawyer trust accounts, uh, IOLTA grants distribution for 2023. I believe we have a presentation from Duan Nguyen. Yes, they are joining. <clears throat> Uh, Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. Trustee Noel, yes, go ahead. Uh, I have to uh, recuse myself from the discussion and from the vote. Uh, the reason for my recusal is that my law firm uh, is a recipient of funds from the Trust Fund Commission on a regular basis on all their contracts. So uh, it would be inappropriate for me to discuss or to uh, vote on that. Okay, thank you, Trustee Noll. Your recusal is noted for the record. And I would ask you if you wouldn't mind to please uh, turn off your camera and your microphone um, as required by the Political Reform Act, which would essentially thank ask you. you to leave the room. We'll notify you when it's time to come back in. Thank, thank you. you, will do. Okay, if we could have a staff report, please. Good morning, um, members of the board and, um, uh, and Mr. Chair. Uh, my name is Dawn Wing, and I'm the Director of the Office of Access and Inclusion. And I have with me here today, um, Richard Linus, who's the co-chair of the Legal Services Trust One Commission. Again, this is agenda item 706, which will ask for your approval for the IOLTA grants for 2023. Um, we have a lengthy memo prepared in your packet. So we, Rich and I have a short presentation that we're actually going to shrink um, in, in size um, in the interest of time. So let me share my screen. Um, so here's an agenda of what we plan to discuss. I'm going to talk really briefly about the timeline and the background, and then um, Rich is going to uh, over, uh, give you an overview of the reserve policy and then take you through the IELTA revenue projections for 2022 and 2023, um, and then we'll close with the, the commission's um, recommendation. Um, so just very briefly, um, in 2019 and 2020, uh, the, the, uh, the federal funds um, rate was about two and a half percent. And as you recall, when the pandemic happened in March of 2020, um, the interest rates plummeted pretty dramatically to near zero. Earlier this year, they have begun to, to rise again. Um, the federal funds rate, the Federal Reserve met on March 16th and raised um, interest rates by 50 basis point. They met again on May 4th and raised um, interest rates another 50 basis point, um, bringing the, the um, federal funds rate to 1%. On June 15th, um, they met again and raised uh, um, interest rates another 75 basis point, bringing the federal funds rate to 1.75%. They're set to meet another four times this year, and it's anticipated that interest rates will also um, continue to climb with each of those meetings. Um, I'm going to skip over the slide because a lot of this information is in your, your materials, um, but just, just really briefly, um, IOLTA uh, the IOLTA statute has been around um, since the early 80s, and this program has been around for about 40 years now. And we do fund about 100 organizations throughout um, the state of California. Um, they're very reliant um, on, on this funding. I'm going to skip over this. And um, Rich, I'm going to turn it to you to talk briefly about the reserve policy. Welcome, Mr. Rhinus. I believe your, uh, your microphone is muted. Thank you, Chair. Good morning to you, sir, and good morning to the Executive Director and Trustees. It's good to see some of you again. Uh, I will re review very quickly the reserve policy. Uh, as some of you may know, 
uh, it is the intent of IOLTA funding to provide a steady source of income to qualified legal service providers and support centers. Uh, the result of that determination made long ago was that uh, a reserve policy was established uh, in 2006, which uh, employs a formula uh, to allow us during a rising income environment uh, to establish a reserve and increase our grants uh, to grantees. Uh, this formula is not used when declining income environments exist, but we do intend at all times to have a reserve with a very broad range of anywhere from 30 to 75% of the prior year's grants. Uh, this is a policy presently under review by our rules committee, which is working diligently to document it and to make recommended changes to it. But please understand that the reserve policy is in place in order to assure that grants we have committed to for subsequent years are made. Next slide, please. Historically, you can see here in the six years that are shown uh, the Fed funds rate and its variances that result in total revenue changes that are sometimes quite dramatic. Keep in mind that the Fed funds rate is only one half of the formula by which we generate revenue, IOLTA revenue. The other half, of course, is the amount of deposits that are made in attorney trust accounts. As a result, you can see over the years uh, that without the high and the low, there's generally been an increase uh, after 2012 to uh, the current levels. And as you'll see in the next slide, we're projecting a grant of approximately $35 million for 2022 and a larger grant in 2023. Next so, slide. Uh, so before we, we talk about um, our 2022 and 2023 projections, I just wanna go over what our revenue was in 2021. So every year we bring this agenda item um, before the board for approval. Um, and this time last year, we had projected to close out 2021 um, with $25.8 million. And you'll see um, on the last column there, we actually did a lot better than we thought. We closed out the year with uh, about $36.7 million there. Um, so we, um, are, we, we, we uh, had about $11 million more than we thought we would. So that's why that was really great news. Um, and I'm going to really, the next two slides kind of talk about the underlying assumptions and how the staff and the commission um, came to their projections in 2022 and 2023. The big takeaway is that we've already received about $3.2 million in bank remittances um, the first uh, quarter of this year. Um, we are um, anticipating the interest rates are going to rise um, to at least 2.25% by the end of the summer. And there's a strong likelihood that they're going to uh, rise to 2.75% at the end of this year. Um, the other big takeaway to think um, that, that we want you to keep in mind is even though we're in a, a um, climbing um, rate environment, we do anticipate um, because interest rates are going to climb that some of our leadership bank programs are going to be pulling back. Um, and that we do think that um, because of uh, the uncertainty of the economy, um, our leadership bank program and our ECR banks, um, there's gonna be a 35% reduction in deposits. Um, with all those kind of assumptions in mind, um, we're projecting our uh, 2022 IOLTA interest rate revenue to be $24.3 million and total revenue to be 32.9. And for 2023, um, this is where we're going to really see a meaningful increase. Um, we're projecting uh, $38.8 million trial to interest revenue and $46.4 million in total revenue. And Rich is going to um, walk you through um, and spend a little bit more time on the next two slides so you have a full understanding of, of um, what our um, cash on hand reserves will be at the end of 2022 and 2023. Just a bit of background before going into the detail here. Uh, we are uh, concerned about the volatility of the market, blessed by the fact that two of our commissioners are bankers with experience, one who's served on the commission on and off for a number of years. Uh, and th this is a great benefit to the commission to have the input of non-lawyer bankers who are, uh, enable us to take full advantage of the IOLTA statute and our relationship with participating banks. We have been advised by one of our participating banks uh, that it may withdraw from our program, not meaning that it will withdraw from making contributions, but it won't be a preferred bank any longer. And this uh, also gives us some concern. So as you will see, our reserve policies have become somewhat conservative in light of 
uh, an increasing, uh, anticipated increasing revenues, but nevertheless, an unforeseeable future. As Duan said, uh, we have actual numbers for you and the first number on this slide, uh, which is uh, uh, the quarterly revenue. Uh, we expect for the balance of the year to add a $21 million in revenue, bringing the total to 24 million. There are contributions that we receive annually and those are listed, uh, including the Justice Gap Fund, uh, which is uh, shown there. And so the net result will be total revenues for 2022 of 32 million. Uh, almost $33 million. We plan on making grants slightly greater than that amount. Uh, and keep in mind that we annually have about $2 million in uh, administrative expenses paid from the IOLTA revenues uh, and Justice Gap Fund administration. So our expenses are going to exceed the amount of the grant this year by almost uh, $5.7 million. The result of that will be that our reserve position will decline by that amount to about $31 million. Next slide. So picking up on that, you can see that if we have IOLTA revenue in, the, in 2023 as projected of a total amount of $46 million, uh, less our administrative expenses, uh, we'd expect uh, at the end of the year to have $75 million available. Um, the prior year grants of 35 million bring that down to a $50 million number, which would uh, enable us to increase our grants from 2022 by almost uh, 43 uh, percent. We would still be maintaining a reserve of 24 million plus, uh, which is about a 75 percent target on the prior year's grants, which is always our target. It is at the high end of the target, uh, as I mentioned before, for fear of the volatility of the market. Next slide. We'll stay on this slide. Um, sorry, Rich, uh, is it, if it's okay in case um, any of the, uh, the trustees have questions and then we can advance to the, the motion. Okay. I don't see any questions here in the room. Anybody uh, remote have questions? Okay, let's move on to the next slide. Thank you. And the next slide is our proposed motion. Hey, uh, thank you both for the very thorough report, uh, elucidating numbers for sure. If there are no questions, do we have a motion for the resolution as presented? This is Sonia. All right, so move. Motion by Delenn. This is Brandon, I'll second. Second by Stallings. Here we have the roll, please. Broughton. Chen. Yes. Cisneros. Aye. Dela Cruz? Yes. Delenn? Yes. Noel? Trustee Noel has recused himself. Deleg? Yes. Shelby? Aye. Sol? Aye. Stallings? Yes. Tony? Aye. Nine ayes, zero nays, one recusal, one absent. The motion carries. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Nguyen. Thank you, Mr. Reines. Good to see you both. Appreciate your work on this. Okay, that takes us to uh, 12.05. Should we break for lunch? Folks want to power through at least one more item. I'm okay either way. Okay, why don't we, uh, I'm told that the rest of the open session items should take 15 minutes or so. Um, and then we can just do a closed session working lunch. All right, uh, next is item 708. Uh, may I come back, Chair? Yes, you may, Mr. Null, thank you. <laughs> All right. Welcome thank back. Thanks. Item 708 is discussion and approval of the 2022 budget amendment. Ms. Montoya Chico will be presenting. She is joining. Thank you. There she comes. Good afternoon and welcome. I'm here. Good afternoon, everyone. 
Um, so this next agenda item is a proposal to amend the 2022 budget. Um, I don't have a presentation, but the individual details of the amendments I'm proposing are in attachment A of this agenda item. So I'll start by saying um, there's two categories of amendments I'm proposing. The first category is amendments to correct technical inaccuracies and errors we made when we adopted the budget. And the second category is um, our amendments as a result of new information that has come to light after the budget was amend amended, adopted, excuse me. Um, all of these amendments are related to grants. So grant-related revenues and grant-related expenses, they do not impact the general fund or any of the administrative funds. It's entirely grant-related funds. Um, as you know, the, or all our grant funds are passed through, so we get the funds and then we pass them through to the grant recipients. So in the first category, um, this amendment would add an additional 7.8 million in grant revenues and an additional 22 million of grant related expenses. And those are mainly due to corrections of uh, the HB, Homeless Prevention 2 and Homeless Prevention 3 grants and the bank settlement grant. And on the second category, the amendments would add an additional $4 million of grant related revenues and $9 million of grant related expenses. And this second category is mostly due to one grant, which is the Cal HFA grant. Uh, it's a new grant that was just awarded to us in uh, June 2022, so last month. Um, I am asking for this uh, amendment to be effective June 30th, so that's the end of our Q2. Um, and this amendment is, to, is meant to better align our revenues with our actuals. Uh, and when we do future quarterly reports, quarterly financial reports, um, the variances that existed in Q1 will the significant variance, because this is how we uncovered some of these errors, um, will go away. Um, so if anybody has any specific questions on any of the amendments, I'm happy to answer them. Otherwise Thank you, we can Thank you Ms. Montoya Chico. I don't see any questions in the room. Uh, for folks who are uh, following along in the agenda item, uh, attachment A is page four of this, of this item. Um, any questions from folks remotely? Mr. Chair, this is Arnie. I'd like to, to move the resolution. Thank you, Trustee Sowell. Is there a second? I will I'll second. Trustee Tony got the second first. Uh, if there's no discussion, we'll hear a vote, please. Broughton? Chen? Yes. Cisneros? Aye. De La Cruz? Yes. Delenn? Yes. No? Yes. Seleg? Yes. Shelby? Aye. So? Aye. Stallings? Yes. Tony? Aye. Ten ayes, zero nays, one absent. The motion carries. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Montoya Chico. That'll take us to item 709, which is a return for public comment and a request for approval with respect to proposed amendment to rule. 2.11, which is the due date and form of payment for licensee fees. Ms. Wilson, please. Yes, so I'm asking the board uh, to adopt amended uh, rules 2.11 and 2.13, although I do have a slight, slightly modified uh, rule amendment for the board to consider based uh, in part on public comment received um, as amplified uh, by feedback that I got from trustee Tony. So this item you may recall uh, seeks to clarify the state bar's authority to promulgate guidelines for what constitutes a conforming payment. Uh, the intention behind the rule amendments is to give the, the bar new tools, both uh, incentives and um, penalties uh, associated with non-conforming payments. And in the original agenda item, I laid out for you some of the challenges we have when we receive non-conforming payments. We received three public comments uh, on this um, rule proposal. And one of them uh, indicated that um, the understanding or the read on the proposed amendments was to obviate the ability of licensees to sub make any payment by check. And that was not the intention of the rule amendments. Uh, but when Trustee Tony also shared a similar concern with me, it, it made me think that there needed to be some clarification. So uh, Louisa, if you're able to, 
I'd like to uh, put up a modification to the amendments to Rule 2.11. I don't know if folks can see that. The additional language is in yellow. So it indicates that the state bar is authorized to prescribe acceptable forms of payment, including but not limited to electronic payment by credit card or check and payment by physical check. Um, and then the other language, uh, any attempted payment that does not conform to a method. So it's making a distinction between forms and methods. Um, looking at it now, I think Trustee Tenney, you may have some suggested language to make that even stronger, but um, this it was an attempt to address both the public comment received and your, your concern. So with that, I mean, then my ask is the board would adopt the new amended amended rule 2.11 and then there is the uh, amendment to rule 2.13 that's outlined in the agenda item and has not changed. Trustee Tony. I, I, I would just um, like to say that I appreciate the consideration and um, I think that the proposed amendment uh, does clarify. Um, it's, you know, it's not a substantive change because it's simply clarifying what was intended and um, I'm in full support of it. Thank you for adding that uh, comment on the substantive change. I forgot to mention I did consult uh, with our general counsel and he did let me uh, confirm that this is not a substantive change that would require this to be reissued for public comment. Th that's correct. I agree with Trustee Tony's observation. Thank you, Mr. Rotana. Trustee Sowell. Wondering since we've gotten into a little bit of the detail on what what forms of an electronic payment uh, can take uh, take place, we, we mentioned a credit card. We mentioned by check. Does that also include a debit card? Yes. Okay. That's actually an interesting okay. point because now I'm thinking of PayPal, Venmo, all of those other forms of payment, but maybe those are a part of a part of it. Well, it says forms including, um, so we, we could further specify. I don't know, to be honest with you, if we, we take payment by PayPal, I don't believe that we do. We do take ACH, debit, credit, check. For PayPal, you'd have to have an account. The state bar would have to have an account right. to accept it. And I don't believe that we do, but I, I'm not able to confirm that right now. What about if they start uh, wanting to pay in uh, Bitcoin? <laughs> yeah, the state bar is not, we're not that uh, forward leaning, trustee. <laughs> Noel. Not yet. Was there someone else, uh, someone else remotely who wanted to offer comments? Uh, I did raise my hand, but I don't know if you can hear me well. We can. Thank um, you. you doing? Thank you. I, I'm actually going to ask about the PayPal and other forms of um, digital payment that probably we can uh, explore for, you know, ease of uh, payment by the licensees. I think that's a good suggestion. I, again, I'm not 100% confident. I, I don't know if RSLE is still around, but I'm all, I'm 99% confident we do not take PayPal or Venmo, um, any of the more modern forms of payment. I don't even know if PayPal is that modern anymore, but for the bar, <laughs> it would be. So happy to look into it and uh, further expand our options. Do we have a yeah, PayPal account? I, I can tell you that we do not take PayPal or Venmo payment. Okay. All we right. don't have any plans to set up accounts to, to take payments in that one. Well, don't say we don't have, maybe the board would like us to yeah, assess well, whether yeah, or not there's a suggestion plan, but we, we don't right now. <laughs> we can certainly <laughs> consider it <laughs> <but> right now. <laughs> Trustee Tony has a comment. I'm sorry, Sonia, we missed you. Go ahead. Are we precluded from no um really because that's that's more the way that people pay this day uh, you know uh, so are, are we being precluded from creating accounts like that Montoya? I, I, I I'm sorry go ahead Adesai. oh I was just gonna say I don't, I, I don't know the answer to that I don't know that we're precluded from opening such 
wherever you want to take them from. Oh, I think the way the rule is written, it, it allows us to prescribe methods of payment and it gives some examples, but it doesn't preclude us from expanding those options in the future if they become um, you know, practical for us to do that. So I, I think by adopting the rule, we're not foreclosing that in the future if it becomes an option. That would seem to me to be an administrative function. Trustee Tony. Thank you. The, the only caveat I would like is for there to be a clear assessment of the cost, because there are trans for for every um, there are transaction fees is all I'm trying to say. I just want to make sure that those are taken into account. And you know, I I think the best practice is what we find when we those of us who like to pay our um, registration fees to the Department of Motor Vehicles. Uh, many of us, me included, find it convenient to pay by um, electronically, okay? And they have fees associated with credit card because, there's, you know, there's a fee. And I just want to make sure, my understanding is that when you do PayPal and Venmo, there's um, additional fees. I, I just want to make sure that you know, with our earlier discussion about fees and trying to, you know, that that um, I have no objection with offering multiple channels for payment. Um, I, I, I just want to be thoughtful and make sure that we are aware and transparent about the fees. And we may need to ask people, if you wish to do this option, here's the fee associated with it. That's part of why they like the electronic, uh, you know, doing it from your checking account, because those fees are uh, de minimis, <laughs> if we can use another term. But but seriously, um, I, I just want to make sure that that's part of the evaluation um, and assessment. That's all. I'm not against it. I just want to make sure we keep everything into account. Thank you, Trustee Tony. Can, can I just point out that two, rule 2.18 does discuss um, payments by uh, electronic transfer and authorizes the uh, executive director to set fees for those types of transactions to the extent we decide to do that in the future. Good. So the rule covers it. Wonderful. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, can we have a motion, please? Cisneros, so I'll make the motion. Motion by Cisneros for the resolution as pretended. It is a resolution, correct? As presented. Thank you all for your work on this. Trustee Tony, thank you for the for the uh, good eye out. As the resolution's coming up, can we get a second, please? I'll second. Second by Chen. Can we have the roll? Yeah, I think this um, amendment needs to be, um, I mean, this, um, Resolution needs to be amended. Um, well, it's the amendments to Rule 2.11, but it's the ones that we just put on the screen. So I think we need to reference that fact. Okay. Okay. Amendments to Rule 2.11 of the State Bar Rules as presented to the Board of Trustees um, during its discussion of this item on maybe on July 22nd, 2022. During its discussion of this item. Okay, Trustee Cisneros, are you good with that? Yes. Trustee Chen? Okay, the motion as revised stands before you. If there's no further discussion, can we have the vote? Broughton? Chen? Yes. Cisneros? Aye. Dela Cruz? Yes. Delenn? Yes. No? Yes. Seleg? Do not see Sean is online anymore. Shelby? Aye. So? I'm an aye. Stallings? Yes. 
Tony. Aye. Nine ayes, two absent, zero nays. The motion carries. Thank you, Madam Secretary. That will take us to our last open session item, which is item 70, I'm sorry, 710. This is a requested approval of exception to the CalPERS 180 day wait period and waiver of Board of Trustees policy manual 12 month wait period for appointment of Vanessa Holton as retired annuitant under government code section 21224. Uh, looks like Ms. Krasilnikov is here to present. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, the CalPERS rules require um, a 180-day wait period following the retirement of an employee to reappoint them as a retired annuitant. Um, we can waive that period um, by your action. Um, and the request here is to waive that 180-day period so that Ms. Holton may return as a retired annuitant to help transition the duties of the general counsel to the new general counsel. In addition to a waiver of the 180-day CalPERS wait period, um, the board policy manual also has a 12-month wait period um, for retired employees. Um, and so we are asking for a waiver of that 12-month period as well. Um, if there are any questions about the agenda item, I am more than happy to answer those questions for you. Any questions from the board? No questions, any discussion? Mr. Chair, this is Brandon. I'll move the item. Motion by Stalin. I'll second. Second by Noel. May we have the vote, please? Broughton. Chen. Yes. Cisneros. Aye. Dela Cruz. Yes. Delenn. Uh, yes. Noel. Yes. Seleg. Shelby. Abstain. Soul. I'm an aye. Stallings. Yes. Tony. Abstain. Seven ayes, zero nays, two absent, two abstain. The motion carries. Thank you, everyone. We will move into a uh, closed session. I will make the announcement as required under Bagley Keene. At this time, the board will convene in closed session to consider approval of minutes as presented for three meetings and two items of business. The first is a discussion regarding sale and price in terms of and uh, sale price in terms and leasing price in terms for uh, the State Bar's property at 180 Howard Street in the city of San Francisco, city and county of San Francisco, excuse me. Um, and the second is a discussion regarding the appointment of the general counsel under government code section 11126 sub E sub one. The statutory reference for the real estate is 1126 sub C sub seven. Is there any public comment on the closed session items? If you wish to address the board on any of these closed session items, please indicate your desire to do so by using the raise hand function on Zoom. I do not see any hands raised at the moment. Okay, we will uh, convene into closed session and then as required by law, come out to, uh, to report whether there's any reportable action. Mr. Thanks everyone. This is Arnie. It sounds like folks in the room um, are gonna go into closed session and, and probably eat lunch there. Can you give those that are of us that may be remote just a few minutes to, to grab something and then uh, reconvene with you? Absolutely, uh, 10 minutes enough? Perfect. All right, uh, we will start the closed session at 1234, 1235. I'm feeling generous. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Madam Secretary, members of the board. We are back in open session after uh, considering the two items listed on our closed session agenda. The first was a real estate item with no reportable action. The second item relates to uh, the, the appointment of an, the interim general counsel. Uh, the board took action to appoint Robert Rattana. Robert Rattana as the interim general counsel. Uh, effective, I'm looking for the resolution, I apologize. Thank you.
effective July 11th until August 18th, 2022 at the rate of the annual salary equivalent of $328,000. This of course is made necessary by the fact that the new general counsel uh, to replace the retiring Vanessa Holton, uh, Ms. Aline Dabtian will not be starting with the state bar until until that date, until August 18th. So uh, we do thank Mr. Ratana for his continued service to the bar. And um, with that, I will adjourn the meeting. Thank you.